To be honest, tough luck. I mean, it was a five-minute adjournment, and if they're not back in a minute, or a minute, I am starting without them. Right, ladies and gentlemen, and that includes Councillor Willis, would you please be sitting down? It is, isn't it? Right. We've got the uh, major event of the evening, perhaps, uh, ahead of us, so we move on to um, the pure excitement of land at Valley Park School, Newcut Road, item 12, page 72. Thank you, Chairman. Um, members will know um, that the application was deferred at the 24th of August Planning Committee meeting for further discussions on those points set out on page 76 on the report. You'll also know that there's quite a detailed consolidated urgent update report um, that sets out some <coughs> key issues and in terms of the balancing exercise and draws some conclusions to obviously some key policies in terms of open space, EMV 22 and 23, etc., cetera, et cetera. You'll also note that there is um, the Arboricultural Officer's additional comment in terms of uh, what was previously reported as a veteran tree, and now the Arboricultural Officer has done a lot more further detailed analysis of that and now considers it an aged tree, so not falling within the definition of a veteran, um, however, notwithstanding that issue, paragraph 118 of the MPPS still applies. So I would, if any questions come around that issue, the Arboricultural Officer has made himself available tonight and members could ask questions on those particular points of the officer. We have also um, reserved the TPO order um, that did lapse um, and that was served um, today. Um, so there is a temporary TPO order covering those boundary trees, just for members' update. As an additional update, members will be aware, set out on your urgent update papers, that since the previous meeting, the um, applicants now become the appellants, and they have appealed for non-determination of that application on the 4th of October. So that is regrettable, but now the recommendation needs to change. So. It now needs to change. Had members been able to make a decision, they would have, and I'll leave that hanging. Obviously, the officer recommendation is they would have approved subject to the 106 and the conditions attached in your papers. Um, but obviously, uh, members, the power to make a decision on this application now rests with the planning inspectorate. So what I propose to do, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of detail going through the application, just refresh members' memory from the 24th, uh, and I'll go through some of the slides just to, excuse me if I do go through these quite quickly, members can always ask me to go back again. So obviously you've got the aerial view of the school site, Newcart Road, public footpaths shown down in this area, A20, and the school is proposed to be located in approximately this position, existing tennis courts, the application proposes a new roundabout in this area here, um, just in close proximity to Grovewood Drive, and obviously the existing mugger, and this application would facilitate the construction access road over here to what is already approved in outline, a new sports hall provision. You will notice set out on your um, recommendation that part of the recommendation is that the school should not operate until that school facility, the sports facility, is open. Now, that is the request of Sport England. So that's just putting some context. Um, going very quickly through uh, the slides, you'll notice the change in levels, uh, principally across north to south. Uh, this is looking north to south. 
You've got Vinters Park over this side, and you've got the A20 down here. I'll just move through these quite quickly. They are self-explanatory. Again, this shows the levels. New access in approximately this position here. Removal of approximately 32 trees around this area, which are um, mature trees. There are specimen oaks there. There is the aged tree in terms of the holly tree that the horticultural officer refers to. And in addition, there are approximately 90 new trees planted uh, in compensation for, sorry, in mitigation uh, for the loss of those trees uh, near and around the entrance to the car parking area in the access. Uh, this is the public right of way that runs to the north. You've got Finter's um, Park on to the right hand side. Just a matter of context, obviously the alley, the area of landscape importance, currently sweeps over the entire site. Uh, including the sports field. That area is proposing to be changed under the emerging local plan and in terms of um, the designation will stop in Vinters Park and will not include uh, the area of the school playing field moving forward. Um, and, and as we already know, that is going to full council on the 25th of October. So this is just looking the context of the Newcut Road in, in the proximity of the roundabout. These are the trees, and obviously that uh, would propose, as I said, 32 trees approximately proposed to be removed uh, in order to facilitate a new roundabout access. Your report does set out, as I previously alluded to, um, that four various options for access were considered and for various options were discounted either due to engineering works, highway safety, congestion issues, loss of sports pitches, uh, etc., etc., and they are set out in the officer's report. Again, this is looking from the junction of Grovewood Drive uh, in terms of where the proposed access would go. Um, some further photographs showing the tree belt. As I said, this is the TPO tree belt that was, recent, that was just resurfed today. This is within the site. Um, looking towards the uh, maintenance access, um, you've got the A20 running over to the right-hand side. You've got the existing maintenance access with the Tarmacadden track here running parallel to the A20, and there is an unmade track running along the side of that woodland. That is proposed to be used as a footpath for school children so that will connect into the new access point. They would be able to walk down here and then connect through the maintenance access onto the A20 um, running down here. So in terms of, of connectivity to the existing um, connections, that's how that would be accessed down here. Uh, again, um, looking out from the proximate location of the new access, this is just a view from Vinter's Nature Reserve and the, the Mugger floodlights uh, can not quite so easily be picked out, but just in the distance over here. Um, and the school site is just behind that dense set of trees, the proposed site off to the left over here. So turning in terms of the, um, the block plan um, submitted as part of the application, as again I previously referred to the pedestrian access that would be proposed to come off the new access. This is the roundabout um, in terms of 104 car parking spaces, um, cycle provision. These are all existing existing facilities which would be combined, the existing mugger, and this is the access road that I previously referred to that this application helps facilitate to deliver the sports provision that already has outlined planning permission but is conditioned to be um, made available and constructed prior to first use of this school site. Uh, these are the planting belts and I'll previously refer to those in a later date. Um, in terms of dimensions of the school, again, three storeys in height, over three floors, gross floor area, 9,188 square metres, 12.6 metres maximum height, solar panels on the roof, um, there's 30 cycle parking spaces proposed here, um, and you pre I've previously referred to the, the loss of the tree issues. So this is looking at the landscape plan for the whole school field. Um, and that principally looks at the landscape in detail here, but the retention of the existing boundary treatment, except this, um, obviously, where the proposed access is proposed. And then this looks at the landscaping plan in greater detail for the school site. And again, I won't go into too much detail uh, in terms of those, but there's parking provision to the front, um, accesses to the front and to the side, principal accesses to the school building here, and obviously 
accessibility of the existing sports pitch um, provision. Sport England uh, have raised no objection to the application on the basis of the conditions that they've set out in the report and principally on the basis that um, the configuration of the existing sports pitch remains, and I'll come to that slide later on, as it is, because any further encroachment um, into the existing, into the proposed um, pitch provision will actually deplete, deplete the overall sports provision on site. Just about, just to show some, I'm not going to go through these, the elevations, the floor plans, as I said, it's over three floors, you know the height in terms of the solar panels on the roof that are proposed. Um, elevations, principally, you're looking at um, um, light grey brickwork with a darker grey render, through render, through the building. And those are the proposed principal elevations, materials, um, some 3D perspectives, again, car parking over, over here, um, where you can see the, the material palette with the two entrances to the main school site here. This is a, a sixth form, 1,200 school pupil requirement. Uh, again, just looking from, from south to north, and you can see the level changes. Again, uh, and this is just sets out the three options. Again, I'm not going to refer to in the report. There were a number of options considered for alternative access arrangements. As I said, uh, the report does set these out in quite a lot of detail. And I'm not proposing 6.27 to 6.32 um, sets out all the various options of why they were discounted um, for various reasons. Again, you look at the roundabout design, uh, which shows the tree loss, which is approximately 32 uh, trees, uh, some of those comprising grade A trees, and the agricultural officer will go into further detail. The Pelican Crossing in this point here, um, and their improvements in terms of this area to facilitate um, pedestrian and passage. So obviously pedestrians could cross on this side, cross over to the site, the Pelican Crossing down here. And likewise, if they were crossing down to the south, they'd come down that, that proposed pedestrian footway, link up to the maintenance access and on to the A20, which obviously has a combined pedestrian stroke cycle route, uh, which will take you into town in terms of the main um, transport hubs in the town centre. So in terms of those are the principal issues. Uh, I mean, obviously, as I said, the report sets out the various details and the options for staggered junctions, etc in those locations, but this is the access proposal that members are considering before you tonight uh, and your recommendation of would you have approved the application had you been able to. Lastly, um, just go into the configuration issues of the sports pitches. As I said, um, key considerations of the application stage were to retain the best and, dare I say, the best and most versatile sports pitches on the site. There are staggered levels, about three levels approximately across the site. Sport England's discussions were to retain the most usable level pitches, which are these ones here. Um, hence, that's why the building was chosen to be located in this position here. There was another level change up here and to retain this pitch provision here. So that does dictate to a degree where the school can be located and also to a point where the access roads can be located. So, you know, there is a balanced consideration to be made in terms of Sport England, highways considerations, etc. Um, I've probably said enough uh, in terms of the issue. I think the, the balancing exercise that the officer's report sets out in the urgent update is very detailed on that proposal. There are quite a lot of factors that members need to balance. Um, obviously, the applicant, as you say, has appealed for non-determination. They weren't prepared to negotiate on the amendments that members requested from the 24th of August, and that's clearly set out in your officer's report. Um, now, you know, that is regrettable, but officers have to come up with a recommendation in terms of the balancing exercise that's considered. There are policies both for and against, so in terms of the overall conclusions, there are policies that pull in different directions. What I would say to members that um, in terms of the um, adopted local plan 2000, the urgent update report sets out that um, reduced weight should be applied to some of those policies on the basis that some of those policies are going to be replaced. For instance, I use an example of DM 22 and 20, sorry, uh, ENV 22 and 23. Now, on that basis, they are being replaced by DM 19. 
which is, dare I say, it's not such a high hurdle in terms of loss of open space because it, it doesn't have so many trigger points that you have to meet in order to reach that. So in terms of waiting, and I don't wish to go through every detail because it is set out here, um, there is an element of reduced weight that should be applied to those existing policies. I also say in terms of the alley designation is not coming down into the playing fields areas. So in terms of the policy requirement that um, is, there is no protection moving forward on the school playing fields in terms of local landscape issues uh, in the emerging local plan. So I accept there is a balancing exercise to be made but the one key consideration on this point is the desperate need in terms of school places in the locality. Now, the KCC commissioning plan goes into a lot of detail on that, um, and KCC uh, without, are already going to go below their 5% government threshold in terms of delivery, in terms of year seven places on this basis. And a lot of the policies, in terms of the balancing, have to consider the need and the weight that you attach to need. Notwithstanding that issue, there is a substantial need moving forward and there is substantial weight. I will finish in a minute, Clive. There's just a couple more things I need to go. I also need to advise members, and I, don't, I know members know about it. It's set out in the report about the policy statement, the planning for schools. Um, which says there's a strong presumption in favour of development um, as expressed in the MPPF. And there, it does list out quite a long and detailed criteria. And actually some of the wording um, is quite key in terms of members' decision making tonight uh, because it does give, and, you know, as I said, I don't wish to stifle members' discussion tonight, but I do wish to point out and read one particular point, which in the guidance it says, a refusal of any application for state-funded schools or the imposition of conditions will have to be clearly justified by the local authority. Given the strong policy support for improving state education, the Secretary of State will be minded to consider such a refusal or imposition of conditions to be unreasonable conduct unless it is supported by clear and cogent evidence. So they are... In terms of the wording, the Secretary of State is already imposing a will, not is minded, is already imposing a will be minded to consider. So, to the way that's interpreted, it's already a warning in terms of a, a cost warning on terms of those issues. So, I don't, as I said, wish to stifle the issue, but the wording is quite clear in that, in that documentation. Um, and I have to advise members on that basis because that's what we would have to defend. So on that basis, um, I would put the recommendation that had members been able to make a decision, that um, members would have approved the application subject to obviously the conditions that officers have set out. And obviously, I would point out the requirement for an improved Section 106 in terms of travel plan requirements. And obviously, you know, the recommendation is set out in the report that is part of a negotiation uh, that we would still have to do. And what I would do is request delegation authority uh, from members to negotiate on that Section 106 requirement because obviously we're now at an appeal stage and we'll now need to move forward to agree those or, or that wording or those requirements. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Right, we now go to the various speakers. Uh, we have Mr. Rogers, an objector first. Mr. Rogers, if we have three minutes. Right. Councillors, good evening. Um, I speak on behalf of many of the residents of Grove Green who can't be here tonight due to the fact that they're working late. Uh, I won't waste anybody's time by reading out some of the letters I've seen and my own letter which has gone to you all, but I would just like to highlight some of the reasons why we feel this application should be rejected. <clears throat> Firstly, the traffic assessment is fundamentally flawed. It assumes that it's possible to increase the schooling capacity of the site by up to 50%, yet not expand the walking uh, catchment area. As we know, much of the walking catchment area is already taken up by Moat Park, 
Vinters Valley Nature Reserve and to the motorway towards the north. It is therefore not credible to say that only 600 pupils will travel by road transport. It does not take into account the additional traffic that will be generated by the Kim's expansion, uh, where the new care home is being built, and the two new schools where outline planning permission has already been granted, let alone the new development on Maidstone Studio land. We must not forget this is a STEM school offering specialist education and as such will generate interest from a much wider area. We have spoken to an architect who built a STEM school uh, in the north and he has confirmed that the catchment area is more likely to be up to 40 miles, not 30 kilometers. Only last week we saw Newcut Road completely gridlocked with minor road works taking place at the Maidstone Studio. With an additional roundabout and a new Pelican crossing, we believe a similar situation will occur. <laughs> Turning now to the parking on Grovewood Drive South, the proposal says that they will introduce parking restrictions for up to one hour during the day. This will prevent staff and sixth formers from parking. But this will not prevent drop-off or pick-up at peak times, which will create a major road safety issue. This can be demonstrated by looking at the issues that occur now at St. John's School, where parents park on double yellow lines, two wheels on the curb, completely ignoring the road signs. I would invite members of this committee to come along and stand at the junction of Newcut Road and Grovewood Drive uh, and see just how the, uh, road work, uh, the, the, the road conditions are, particularly after the park and ride was closed. Um, the planning officer suggested that there should be a robust travel plan in place. I'm sorry, Mr. Rogers, that's three minutes. I'm okay. sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Mr. Hinder, Boxley Parish Council. Thank you, members. Uh, may I begin by offering my personal support for the development of a STEM school. My career was as a senior teacher and specialist in technology, so I recognize what this school intends to offer to children for their secondary education. However, I, like so many residents in Boxley Ward Parish, do not see this as being the most appropriate place to situate the school's entrance. Much as what has been expressed by members, representatives and residents at previous meetings has hinged heavily on the opinion that this is just not the right position to put the entrance. Very recently, we, and perhaps you also, had the situation of being caught up when temporary traffic lights were installed in Newcut for some roadworks. The resulting chaos really highlighted that something relatively minor is all that is needed to tip the balance and cause gridlock. That will be the case with the installation of a new roundabout and traffic lights at the junction of Newcut and Grove Road Drive South. It has been accepted in reference 7.4 that this new school will result in additional traffic flows and congestion at nearby junctions, but then offer solace to the local residents by suggesting that it will not be severe. The Parish Council, on behalf of all the residents of Grove Green, therefore requests that in the conditions laid upon this development, if granted planning permission, be clear measures that will be taken to negate some of the traffic effects upon local residents. We would welcome parking restrictions being put in place in Grovewood Drive South, but ensuring that they are in place before the development commences. In addition, some form of traffic parking restriction measure be put in on adjacent minor roads to stop those who would have parked in Grovewood Drive South just moving short distances into the minor roads. This is a real concern of the local residents. It must be borne in mind that since the closure of the Sittingbourne Road Park and Ride, 
scheme, this area has become notorious for commuters to park. I would also like to raise a question. How does a reduction of parking place spaces in the new travel plan encourage people to use public transport? I would suggest it will make people park elsewhere, probably to the detriment of the local residents. And can I draw your attention in the, your urgent update to the bottom paragraph in the conclusion where it's got planning balance. This I've only had a chance to read, obviously, tonight like you. But it states there, the roundabout would result in a betterment in terms of traffic flows and reduce congestion times along New Road compared to the existing situation. If you put something in the middle of a road, I can't see, gentlemen, members, that that makes life better. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor Hinder. And uh, continuing the theme, Councillor Mrs Hinder. Thank you, Chairman, members. I, I, I do apologize for what I'm going to say is probably quite similar to what has already been said. But first of all, I'd like to say that I really welcome this new school and I appreciate that it's really needed in Maidstone. Unfortunately, in, in, it is the right school, but in the wrong place. Unless some radical measures are taken to deal with the severe impact upon the traffic flow in this area, children's lives could be put at risk while going to and fro from school. And I'm going to um, emphasize again that many more gridlock locks will happen similar to recently when roadworks using traffic lights were set up outside the TV studios and caused absolute mayhem. This is only for a very short time, but was wholly indicative of what is going to happen when traffic lights are installed on the proposed new roundabout for the entrance to the school. It is well known that Newcup has become one of the unofficial ring roads of Maidstone and has already reached saturation point at Russia. Putting more traffic into the system twice a day at peak times will burst the bubble and be the, and be the tipping point for bringing the traffic and that area of Maidstone to a complete standstill. This school by its nature will have a wide catchment area, pulling in students from all four corners of the borough. This will mean cars coming from Junction 7, Willington Street, Bearstead, Pennington Heath, all ending up at a roundabout in Newcut, trying to dispense up to their children and then leave twice a day. It is time notice it is taken of the potential problems that this will cause to residents of this area. I have grave concerns that there will also be a profound landscape and biodiversity impact with the loss of the very mature trees. I strongly feel that the proposals for the entrance to this school be urgently revised and serious considerations be given to putting another position that is not in New Cut Road. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Mrs Hinder. Councillor Spiegel, please. Good evening, members. I think we're all singing from the same hymn sheet this evening. Um, you have a really difficult decision ahead of you, and I have to admit, I think your hands are tied by the national policy. However, I, f I want to make it clear, I, in principle, I support a new school. It's just the access arrangements that are causing all the problems. I'm really disappointed and saddened to see that very little effort, if any, appears to have been made by the applicant to look at alternative access routes and reduce the loss of mature trees. In fact, in the letter they wrote to you, they make a, a misleading statement by inferring that traffic exiting a left turn only exit further north in Newcut Road um, would cause increased traffic congestion to southbound traffic um, compared to the roundabout when in fact the number of vehicles exiting the school um, would be exactly the same. So if 200 cars are coming out the school and they want to reach the A20, it doesn't matter whether they go that way or that way they're joining the traffic flow. So I think that's very misleading. And I just fail to see how a roundabout can improve traffic flows and with a little pedestrian crossing thrown in for good measure. The concerns I raised previously about the impact the school will have on Newcut Road and surrounding roads is a big concern to residents. At a Macmillan Coffee Morning last Friday, numerous people raised this issue with me. Um, existing school traffic causes a queue all along the A20 from Turkey Mill to Wellington Street well ahead of the normal rush hour. Those who live in this area and use these roads know the problems. Um, I would ask KCC Highways once again if they would confirm that they really are confident about not objecting 
and that the proposed traffic mitigation really will work because I and numerous others, I'm afraid, don't share that confidence. If I recall, KCC Highways didn't object to the new retail development at the north end of Hermitage Lane and accepted the developer's traffic modelling. As I understand it, KCC are now bearing the brunt of the costs to try and sort out that mess. If you are minded to approve this application, would the committee consider adding a condition along the lines of, if the proposed traffic mitigation doesn't work as expected, the applicant must bear the costs of any further works required to address the situation. Local residents will suffer from the congestion and they really shouldn't have to pay through their council tax for the inevitable works that will be required to alleviate it, even if that's feasible. Um, I, I just find it astonishing that even the planning re officer's report picks up that the roundabout will improve or result in a betterment in terms of traffic flows. I'm just astounded. Thank you, members. Councillor Springett, it's always interesting to see you when you're astounded. <laughs> Councillor. No, no, I, I've, got, I've got another speaker before I do lobbying. Councillor Willis. Hello, committee. Um, I'm here solely to talk about transport um, with this application. Um, firstly, the two schools involved in the trust that are behind this application are great schools, so it, we don't want it to be to the detriment of what they've done, but personally, I find it hard to be not actually quite emotional about this application, so I'm going to try and be factual, but I just think it's an absolute travesty of democracy, what's been going on. Um, I'm, on transport grounds, um, I'm trying, going to try and give you some reasons that I believe, in my limited capacity, are reasons for objection or conditions uh, that you must set. First of all, to set the scene, I understand from Kent County Council, uh, and thanks very much for a swift response from our officer here this week, um, that uh, KCC have not accepted the travel plan, unless there's a change to that, which you can discuss after this, have not accepted the travel plan and have asked for revisions to it. So there's a strong I believe a strong reason you can work on within in travel. Um, uh, here's some reasons why I've, I've looked at sustainable transport solely. I hope you don't mind that, but there's some reasons why I think that, that the travel does not fit in uh, with what I understand to be uh, section four of the MPPF, promoting sustainable transport. Sections 29 to 38, you can pick probably four or five of those out if you want to be, to be precise. Um, first of all, the travel plan document, um, as, a, as an example, um, within the document, it sets out how people are going to travel to the school uh, and it compares the other schools, the other two schools have people getting a bus, pupils getting a bus to the town and then walking. Now, year seven, year eight pupils, I'm not quite so sure how well that works. There's also a dedicated bus, I understand, to the other schools. This application does not mention anything of that ilk. In fact, when it talks about bus services, the one thing it asks or mentions in bus services is that the buses, the bus timetables that are in the travel plan, which is appalling, frankly, I think, uh, are all going eastwards towards Beersted. So I suggest in all their pupils come that way or from the town. That's not true. They will come from the west, the south. They will come from all areas. And also, it's got a commuter coach timetable in it. So of the five timetables they provided, one of them is a commuter coach. And I can confirm it's in there. It's not deliberate. It's in there, uh, so, you know, Canary Wolf, perhaps their catchment area might be Canary Wolf as well, I don't know. But there's your community coach timetable. Um, uh, there are no, um, there's no proper bus terminal. If you go to the slide that the officer had up showing the school site, uh, there's no proper bus terminal option. One of our bus operators made that objection, uh, made that point. There could be, when I had a meeting with the consultant yesterday, uh, who are frankly funded, it appears funded by the English schools agency, trying to bulldoze this through. Um, they, they said they have no plans to upgrade that. It could be done, but they don't plan to do that. I asked them. I also asked them about cycling, whether, bear in mind, there is a cycle, cycle route 17 and 19 that run along the A20. Could you link to those routes, or will you be providing any money uh, towards um, linkage with that safe linkage so the kids can get there okay? I asked, I even put an olive branch and said, you know what, I'll speak positively if you do that. Uh, I've had no response. They haven't done that. This is appalling. Uh, it gets to me, frankly, and it could set a precedent for other schools in our area. We need to be brave on this one. 
and use decent reasons why we're going to object or come up with reasons. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Willis. Very interesting. Right. Now, declarations of lobbying, please. Well, uh, Councillor Stockall, you the, have you been lobbied? Yes. That's everyone. Right. Now, as, as Mr. Bailey said earlier, we do have a significant urgent update on this. I did mention it earlier, but I, I suspect that people have, have not necessarily read it. So I know there's been a, it's been a bit stop, hit, stop and start this evening, but nevertheless, it is important the members do read this urgent update. Five minutes to read that. Members, five minute adjournment to read that report.
I'm hopefully hopeful that members have now had a reasonable length of time to read the update. It was important that we be careful and sure and transparent about these things. Now, um, we have a number of speakers who've already indicated. I think the very first was Councillor Harwood, perhaps appropriately, given where we started with this discussion. Councillor Harwood. Thank you, Chairman. This is a really important application in, in a number of um, ways. And it's one that we really do have to get right. Um, I, first of all, in terms of procedure, the, the basis that the National Planning Policy Framework uh, is, was, was established and the MPBG that supports it is that dialogue should take place to overcome harm and to overcome um, concerns and problems that arise from a planning application. In relation to this site, I, I've yet to meet anybody who does not think that the campus at Vinters Park could bear another school. And that has been a starting point in terms of, of, of um, a, a basis for discussion. However, where the sticking point has come has been in relation to the access and egress and, and the precise location of the school. And that's where the point that was, that was very succinctly made by the ward councillor about this being in the right school in the wrong place kicks in. And that is where it is very, very unfortunate that the applicants have chosen not to negotiate or discuss these issues. We, we attempted it. We raised this issue at the pre-application discussion and stated this is the key point that needs to be overcome. I mean, there's you know, a number of us at that meeting. We're actually former pupils of Inter's Boys. We, we, we understand the issues that go on. We, we know very well the issues that are there. Local residents, are, are, they, they understand the issues, and that's where the applicant should have discussed and should have taken on board. We gave the applicant another bite of the cherry at the meeting um, two cycles ago, where we had a deferral to discuss in good faith some of our concerns around the access and egress and the, the road safety, the congestion implications of that, and the implications it has for an important local landscape. But as can be seen from the papers, um, the, there was a, we were rebuffed. There was a, there was a rejection of that. and. Yeah, well, that's all we can do as a planning committee. We can ask if the applicant chooses not to um, to discuss with it, it, it we're placed in a difficult situation. Mm -hmm. To a certain extent, I can see why schools are doing this. The, the, the planning for schools guidance is a, is a, is a very bu a bullish and robust document. How come, however, it does not trump planning law, it does not trump national planning policy framework, and that's where we really do need to, to identify the, the, the issues and the problems with this site. I am quite surprised by some of the statements around highways issues. We do know that Newcut Road is part of the unofficial ring road for Maidstone, um, and it links into Willington Street and so on, and it bears an awful lot of traffic. And, and we know two weeks ago, some utility road works, not even a road closure, it was just literally a light junction on a roundabout, it meant that children were, that their parents were, were two hours late picking them up from St John's School. It gridlocked the whole of uh, East Maidstone and back traffic up over Detling Hill and to Stockbury. The, if anybody thinks that a 1,200 pupil STEM school, which has a much greater catchment than a, than a, a comprehensive school like Valley Park or, or even the Invicta Grammar, um, will not have profound implications on the transport network and will not have a severe impact. If an inspector found that Borton Lane would have a severe impact from 200 homes being built on the playing field, how they can think that the, the new pedestrian crossing the scheme, that the, the school day coinciding with, with the rush hour, that this will not have a profound impact and a severe impact I, I, I think that in any appeal we, we can argue that case and, and we can evidence it, which is more important. So I think that's a, 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 a absolutely critical issue here. The other issue is in terms of 
the size of the car park, the amount of vehicular use for the site is relatively small. And yet, we are confronted with, uh, to my mind, hugely over-engineered over piece of highway infrastructure um, to, to gain access and egress to the site, which will have a, a, a very profound impact on the, the, the historic um, parkland boundary. And that is quite important because the MPPF is very clear that when, when it talks about aged trees, and when it talks about large trees, it, it actually says that applications should be refused and, unless um, the, 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 the clear benefits of development clearly outweigh. And I take that there should be negotiation and discussion to overcome that harm and achieve another option. Um, further, in section 12 of the MPPF, it, it also talks about the fact that, that Parkland should be treated as, a, as, a, um, as, a, as an, an asset in terms of, um, of, the, of its historic, historic, historic significance, um, which I think is an important issue here because we have the equivalent of a photographic record of these very trees from the 1790s when Humphrey Repton, the landscaper, actually drew it. And you can actually pick out the individual trees in his red book. You know, if there's any evidence we could give to an inspector that this is a really important vista and really important trees, it's the fact we've, we've still got a Humphrey Repton red book, which actually you can pick out the actual trees. And the largest tree in that entire Parkland boundary will be lost, a large oak. And, and that, you know, is, is of, of, of some profound significance. So I, I, I want to kind of hear how this goes on, but, but I believe that what we should be saying um, is that we were seeking constructively to negotiate a, an, an acceptable access and egress which did not harm the local traffic network, did not impact upon uh, road safety issues in the way that a roundabout would with its flowing traffic because the children will cross at the nearest point, they'll go straight across from Grove Green across the arms of the roundabout. And also we were seeking to negotiate a, an access and egress which did not have the same harm to such an important parkland boundary. Um, but unfortunately, we, we've not been given that opportunity. We, we've seen the applicant appeal for non-determination. And I think it would be important that we test this at the appeal to, to, so, that we re, so that we can actually achieve a better option because otherwise I, I fear for the economic well-being of the town with the gridlock that will arise. I fear for the, the character of the town from the loss of, of some of its, its, its most historic landscape. But most of all, I fear for the children who have got to get in and out of this site safely each day of the week. And I currently do not think they do. And I think the, the, the government's guidance on schools is making applicants think that they're untouchable and they can put any application in, in any site, they, they cannot. And we as a planning authority have, have got to make that abundantly clear. Councillor Prince. Chairman, I do want to speak, but I'd like to hear what highways have to say first, please. And perhaps uh, Mr. Gallivan would want to speak at the same time and then, well, after, you know, in the same... <laughs> Slot. Thank uh, you. Yes. Um, um, yeah, I will take as we're on the subject the arboricultural comments first, if you don't mind, because we more or less follow on from what was being said. Okay. I don't know if there's anything in, in specifics that you'd like me to respond to. Um, my comments in the urgent update report were a response to. Um, a very simple question, yes or no, is it a veteran tree? Um, as always with simple questions, it's a very complex answer. Um, we spent some time discussing it. Um, essentially, it is a very old tree for the species. Um, we just don't feel that at this point in time it displays enough characteristics to, f to tick the boxes to fall into that category of veteran. But it's still obviously a valuable tree. Um, in terms of the loss of that landscape boundary, yes, the proposal 
will result in a lot in the loss of a large number of trees, some of which are old, some of which are interesting ecologically. Um, but nonetheless, that's a proposal put before, before us. Um, so members have to decide whether or not the planning balance of losing those trees is outweighed by the need for a school in this location and the access where it's proposed. Thank you. Mr. Wright, uh, and also, um, if you wouldn't mind, because it's been raised in addressing not just the, um, shall we say, the highway infrastructure, but also some of the travel plan issues. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Just firstly, to, to pick up on the points that uh, Councillor Harwood raised, Newcut Road, we, we would fully recognise that that is, that is a well-used route. And certainly the Highway Authority has, has always been of the view that the school will have a localised impact. So I'd like to just be clear on that from the very outset. What it boils down to is the extent to which that impact can be mitigated and then whether the residual impact um, is then, can then be deemed severe in accordance with the National Planning Policy Framework. So that's, that's the thought process that we have to go through. Now, in this instance, and, and looking particularly at the, the site access arrangement, as Mr. Bailey alluded to earlier, the, the applicant has looked at a number of site access options, really to try and come up with a, a solution that will minimize any impact. The proposed roundabout is being put forward in conjunction with a reduction in the speed limit and a controlled pedestrian crossing facility. Now those elements, when combined, what they do is they provide a suitable means of maintaining traffic flow along Newcut Road, whilst also reducing the vehicle speeds and providing a better environment for the pedestrian and cyclist activity that a school will inevitably generate. Those access arrangements were the subject of a road safety audit and they were also um, capacity tested through modelling. Um, the findings of those showed that there was no fundamental safety issue and that the roundabout could operate effectively and that there wouldn't be any queuing interaction issues with the Ashford Road, Newcut Road junction. So it's on that basis that the Highway Authority is comfortable with what has been proposed in access terms. Where we do have a, a, a different view, and this, is, this has some relevance to the travel plan, um, is in terms of the scope for pupils to travel by alternative means, and in particular by bus. So the travel plan is a document that we, we have reviewed and commented on. But what we said quite clearly is that that document, the content of that document, needs to be developed further um, so that there is more rigorous monitoring of bus capacity. Because a, a key concern that we have is that the, the bus capacity on local services simply isn't available uh, to accommodate the additional demand that the school will generate. And of course, there's no legally binding requirement on the commercial operator um, to lay on additional services to meet that demand. And in such instances, um, it falls to the county council to then step in and make up any shortfall. And there are no guarantees that the county council will have the resources to do so. So in our comments, we've, we've been quite clear that we think the travel plan mechanism for monitoring is required alongside contribution secured via section 106 to ensure that the provisions can be made available um, in terms of bus service capacity um, and really without those provisions we would have grounds to object to this planning application. Thank you very much Mr Wright. Um, does that answer your questions, or would you like to explore these issues further, Councillor? Uh, what Mr. Wright just meant, uh, spoke about, the Section 106 um, provision for the bus service capacity, I'd like to explore that a little bit more, please. I, I don't really understand. 
Yeah. What, what we're saying really is that a sum of money would be secured so that in the event that there was monitoring, it was found that there, wouldn't, there was not sufficient capacity on bus services to take all of the pupils that wish to travel that way. That money could then be drawn down and those additional buses could be laid on. So it's not, it's not a case of it, we would definitely need the money. It would be if it was found that there was a, an issue, we would have a mechanism through which to deal with it. Yeah, I think, um, um, you know, it's quite, it's quite encouraging. We're, us and KSUC are, are talking along the same lines on this application. I think the only issue is, is that we have an issue with an in-perpetuity request for £140,000 in perpetuity. That is the KCC's request. We don't disagree about the issues. It is set out in our key report about getting a pooling, a pot of money that can look at um, um, sustainable transport measures. It's just the fact that £140,000 in perpetuity, to our mind, doesn't meet the test. So what we are saying and what we usually look at is when you're looking at um, contributions towards bus loops, etc., you may look at a three to five year span. Now, I'll let members do the necessary maths, and it's not for me because the recommendation is, is a pot of money, and I would add on there, it should be negotiated down to the head of planning to negotiate what that sum of money is, but we do agree that there should be a pot of money that could be used for bus contributions, for like um, cycling initiatives, for like vouchers, could be used for, say, like lighting of footways, if that could, could were to come forward. So we are in agreement, I think, with KCC on this basis. It's just about that, that sum of money, so we think it should be only effective to get us to a benchmark level three to five years based on roughly what KCC provide on the evidence which gives you a, a, little, a, a sum of money to negotiate with and then we are suggesting as part of this we would negotiate with the applicants through the appeal process to secure that level of money um, and I think that's hopefully that addresses that point. Thank you Mr Bailey that is um, I think a lot clearer. Do you want to speak now? Okay, thank you. That, that's just um, helped to, cl to clarify a number of things. Um, okay, so I've uh, listened to all the speakers and I'm really mindful of, of their concerns. Um, but the one thing that has come up over and over again is nobody said that they're against the school. They all say that they support the school. So that's a good start. And I've heard the word, um, words planning balance and, you know, planning exercise come up over and over again. And what's worrying me here, you know, the situation is quite clear. We're in the process of building thousands of houses. We need the infrastructure. We need school provision. I happen to be in a position where I know that in a year or two, we're going to be facing a serious shortfall in secondary school places. And I'm not just talking about tens, I'm talking about hundreds, hundreds of places. So we need to send our children to school. And if this, what's worrying me is if this school isn't built, potentially we are talking about sending our young children, you know, year sevens, 11 year olds, um, to schools that might potentially have uh, places available, but they will have to travel, I don't know, 15, 20 miles to get to them, you know, to um, Cox Heath, Morton, Monchelsea borders, uh, Lenham if there are spaces available, and, and I don't think there will be. Um, the other thing, just, just by absolute coincidence today, I attended the annual Kent conference uh, for uh, 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 the 14 to 19 curriculum, and the one thing that kept coming up over and over again was STEM schools, absolute coincidence. And there is, you know, in, in, in terms of science, technology, engineering, maths, there is a serious skills shortage, not, not just in Kent, but nationally. And here we have an opportunity to provide, to fill that gap. And I know there are concerns, but we should be doing something positive about this. We can play a big part in contributing to this serious shortfall. 
Um, what else do I have? So, I, actually, I'm just going to cut to the chase. Knowing what the, the situation is, and not knowing what you've said, Mr Bailey, that there is a, a presumption in favour of state-funded secondary schools, or state-funded schools, full stop. I'm going to move straight away. I know, I know this is a decision that we're just, you know, it's not a decision that stands. That we, um, that, you know, we approve this, this application uh, with the conditions in the updates. I, I think the wording you would be looking for was if this committee were if determining committee, okay. the application. If it this would committee have... were determining this application, I would like to, yeah, that we go with the recommendations as per the papers that we have here. But I'd also like to suggest that we set up, um, you know, if, if this is approved, a local interest group. So we have the ward members. I know there are three wards affected here. There's um, Boxley, Bearstead, and Shepway North, because it sits right on the cusp. I would observe, actually, that the school itself, as opposed to um, the residents around it, is actually in my ward. <laughs> okay, well, there you go. I've actually also added East and High Street, but I didn't know if that would make it far too complicated. But certainly, we need some sort of working group to do something with this. I'll leave it there. Thank you. I, 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 normally, before you come in, um, normally at this stage, one would ask the seconder whether they wish to speak at this point or reserve their right. I'll speak now if that's okay. Of course. I'm happy to second it, but I'm, I'm, and I might come on to sort of a couple of alterations in the conditions that I might sort of suggest coming on. But I have to say that um, I think the attitude the appellant has been disgusted in towards this council, if I'm totally honest, because I think they failed to realise that um, they've got to um, communicate with us, they've got to work with us, that um, these schools have to go through the planning process as an ordinary planning application and um, I think they think they're a bit beyond and a bit above uh, poor little Maidstone Council which just so happens to be the planning authority and um, and I hope someone's they're not here but I hope someone's watching from the uh, from the appellant uh, on the webcast tonight um, and um, can gather that um, that's pretty much what we all think around the table but they've decided to appeal for non-determination and that obviously uh, switches the goalposts somewhat and it's disappointing that we weren't able to make any progress on what we agreed to do six weeks ago um, as a committee or whenever it was. Um, bearing in mind what's obviously not changed or not changed um, sort of since, since the last um, resolution, a lot of um, what I said then um, still stands now. I think you can accommodate a school on this site. Um, uh, but, but we've got to get in place the correct sort of procedures to do so, including things such as the bus routes and the, and the cycle paths and so on and so forth. And that's why it's quite interesting to hear what Mr. Wright was, um, was saying there. Um, we don't know necessarily where the students will come from to a STEM school. We don't really know how um, local it will be, just because there's not been a STEM school in Maidstone um, be um, before. So, um, so it's really quite difficult. And... Um, it's not the inf sort of information that we'll ever have in front of us to make a decision. In terms of the access point, um, bearing in mind the overall sort of nature of the site and the fact that the school really can only go in one place, i.e. where it's proposed. And I don't know if Mr. Bailey can go back to the, um, the, sort of the site layout um, at all. Yeah, there. Uh, well, that, that's actually quite a good example. Um, I mentioned this last time as well. I really can't see sort of any alternative. We can't come down on the pictures at Sport England um, have classified as being very good and are very good. And we can't really, we can, obviously the, the nature of, um, of, uh, of the trees on, on site makes it difficult really to go anywhere else. I do think parking is an issue and I do think we need to address this issue about where the buses actually drop off students because perhaps they could do, as they do at Cornwallis and drive around the car park, perhaps they, they might end up being a bus stop on Newcut Road perhaps. It's not, it, we need to investigate this a bit further. As, as well, because some of these ideas are very good that I've just mentioned, some will be very bad, and some people like them, some people won't. But um, the main thing, actually, for me, is if we are going to have a roundabout at the bottom of Grove or Drive South, we absolutely must, and I hope that the proposer will allow me to, um, uh, to, uh, to add this as part of the recommendations, get the, um, get the parking restrictions, not just on Grove or Drive South, but on all... 
or if whether it's separate resolution or not, but this council absolutely must get to into the side roads as well, perhaps as we, as far as Provence away, um, because I can just see parking being an absolute nightmare on Grove Green as a, as a direct, co as a direct um, consequence of this. So, all in all, I'm supportive of the application. I'm happy to second what's being put on there. Um, I think um, we're in trouble if, we, if this doesn't go through. Let's be totally um, honest about it. And ultimately, it comes down to me to a decision of, yes, some trees are going to be lost. Yes, that goes against national, uh, against some planning policies. But at the same time, as has been said, the policy in favour of schools is, um, is overwhelming. And um, I'd, I wouldn't feel comfortable if I was to deny some of our children education because of some trees, to be totally honest. And, um, and that's what it balances down to for me. And I'm not, and, and, um, and I appreciate some people might disagree with that, but I feel, I'd feel very guilty to allow the, um, to the trees to get in the way of a good um, educational establishment for Maidstone. So I'm happy to second the recommendation. I'll bring Mr. Bailey in in a moment, but I, I, I will speak now as his school, schools, proposed schools are in my ward. The, I think comment, taking these points in no particular order, I, there is a major problem in, in the way that the public transport issues in this report have, and the, the sustainable transport issues are, are, across the board have been handled. Um, there, are, there are other issues as well. Um, dealing with those is, is not particularly simple or straightforward. Just to take a minor example, putting a bus stop in New Cut Road. Well, if you stop a double-decker bus in New Cut Road for the length of time that the pupils will um, take to get on off of a bus of the average uh, school, well, you're going to stop the traffic for quite a long time. So there needs to be some consideration as to how that will work. There hasn't been any. The County Council are completely right when this, to point out the flaws in the travel plan. I don't think... Um, Councillor Bolton, that anyone um, has actually said that there shouldn't be a school on, on this site. There is, is, as has been said, quite a, a strong need for education provision in Maidstone, along with a lot of other services. I was chairman of the Governors of Vinters Boys School, as was, so I know this site extremely well, like Councillor Harwood, and I believe your father, Councillor Burton, um, and, uh, and various others, including a former MP for Chatham and Aylesford. We all attended his school in ru roughly the same time, actually, the golden generation or the, or the opposite of, perhaps the opposite of Vinter's Boys. Whatever the opposite of golden generation is, we probably meet that criteria. But the fact of the matter is that all we were trying to do was carry out the functions of a local planning authority as set out in a national planning policy framework and guidance and actually have a dialogue. I've been on this council and on Tobel Parish Council before that for longer than I care to remember. I have never, ever met a more hostile applicant, ever. And I've met some over the years who have absolutely refused to discuss even the most minor details in, uh, down to the colour of the render on the building, which really doesn't have much of an effect on whether or not they can build it. it, it and have appealed, literally, at the last moment before a situation where we were actually quite likely to grant planning consent because they didn't want any conditions imposed or any negotiation. That's been quite clear all along. Now, I still believe this application should, have, if we were determined, it should have been approved. And that, our recommend, that the recommendation put forward is broadly correct. Um, we would, I think, have said that we would have been minded to approve this application if certain points had been taken on board. The point about the travel plan is an obvious one and a sustainable transport is an obvious one. Regardless of the slight problems about, well, more than slight problems about preserving the landscape, we will probably have been able to, to, to adjust it to some degree. And then there are the issues around the access. Well, I'm sorry, but I was at Councillor Willis's house last weekend and I read a report that was going to the Ebbsfleet Development Corporation about a school application. 
Sports England wanted the playing fields in a particular location. Ebsfleet Development Corporation said that that would undermine other aspects of the plan, including some of the local heritage assets in Gravesend. There are some, believe it or not. Uh, and, and the landscape, and the landscape. So they said, but notwithstanding Sports England's view, that that was not the course they were going to take. Well, you know, I, I, I do think that that is an issue that regardless of how it would have ended up, we should have, as a planning authority, as a planning committee, had the chance to explore. We have not had that chance to explore it. We have not had the opportunity to consider whether alternative arrangements could have been made and this landscape protected. It is, of course, a matter of balance, but, of course, if we took every tree in the world out in order to preserve educational opportunities, there wouldn't be any educational opportunities because the planet wouldn't have a breathable atmosphere. So it is, of course, always a question of, of balance and degree. Um, now, that is an absurd example, but, it, but that is deliberately chosen to emphasize that we do need to strike a balance. We have not had that opportunity, and we need to make it absolutely clear that we would have wanted to impose the condition, which I think should a normal condition for public transport would have been five years in order to get a proper service established, and then we would assume it would become commercial because that would or, or, it, or the need wouldn't be there either way. Um, that we would look at the other sustainable transport issues and we would have tried to explore what more could have been done to preserve uh, the, the, the right balance between landscape and, and the uh, transport issues. We have not had that opportunity. We have not had the opportunity to modify the, even slightly the elevations or facings or materials of the building. We haven't had the opportunity to do anything. So I, have to, so I would hope the movers of the, the, of the recommendation, with which I am in broad agreement, would take on board those points in, in, um, moving forward. And now, Mr Bailey, I think you wanted to come in. I'm going to be quite succinct. Um, my only request to the proposed and seconders is that there is delegated authority, obviously, to the head of planning to negotiate on the terms of the 106. Um, we've seen, we've had highways to turn around and say about that their recommendation would potentially change if they didn't secure those um, contributions towards bus issues. So I think that puts members, transport. sustainable transport issues, um, I think that puts members in a strong position. Obviously I have to be wary of, of the member issue that says in terms of, um, you know, the issue of cost, but I, I think there are valid reasons. You've got the Highways Authority that's raising that issue. I think we've come up with a balanced view, uh, maybe not in perpetuity, but we'd have to come up to, you know, the Chairman has raised potentially five years. I've given members options three to five years to what is a reasonable issue. And we've set out in the report those range of contributions that that could be used for. I suppose I could raise one further point um, in that light. And I and I have to be careful in terms of that this is going into appeal scenario. Obviously, you know, we members will know about the Kim scenario where they set up a monitoring committee. Um, now, a suggestion that the head of planning could put forward at the committee and the request that this council ask is that you could set up a monitoring committee of that, did say that. group. Did say that. Yeah. Um, and that could comprise a representative from Kent Highways, a representative from the officer level, representative of potentially political spokespersons that could come and look at how those transport initiatives would come forward. And I think in terms of we have used it and we could refer the inspectorate to other examples where we've used it. Now, obviously, he may or she may come up and say, does it meet those tests? But it's clearly, it's something that members feel quite passionate about. It's clearly support in terms of Kent Highways, and it's something that, you know, the head of planning could put forward in our negotiations with the applicants. I can tell you now that they'll be, as the chairman has said, be saying we don't want any conditions or any section 106, but I think that is a way to put forward. Members are being reasonable tonight in terms of taking on board all those other issues and balancing those exercises. Um, and I think in terms of that issue, there is a case to put forward to the inspectorate that 
you know, why did they appeal two days before members were having this discussion? And there were some key areas that members really wanted to put forward, and this sustainable transport measures was one element of it. So I think, personally, that's something that, you know, we as, or the head of planning, or you, uh, on your behalf, should be put into the inspectorate to make that case. Thank you very much. So I'm just going to briefly take the move for the motion back at this. Um, only to say I, I had suggested that uh, monitoring group, I've lost my thread, I, I called it a working group, but if we are doing that, we must include the ward members, please. Absolutely. I know we've spoken about Kent Highways and other, other, other interested parties, but the ward members must be included in this. I think there is some overlap because um, I'm, I'm, I'm a ward member and the chairman, and Councillor Harwood is a group spokesman and the ward member, so for, 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 uh, for part of... No, for Boxley, sorry. You're, you're a Boxley Parish Councillor, aren't you, for the relevant area? I thought you were. <laughs> and we've got Boxley members and East Ward members as well. As well. So, so I think we probably could only have one per ward. Per, so, so otherwise it's getting a bit... <laughs> if we had all three ward members on it from each ward, I think it might get a bit unwieldy. by vice members it's it's a, you know because the inspector is going to decide on this eventually it's a representative of those core bodies Kent highways it could be even some of the bus company coming forward yeah. um, you know KCC represent the uh, walking and cycling strategy as well so it's we've got to be a bit careful that in, the inspectors making that decision but uh, as I said I think if we got those key parties and maybe political spokespersons I think that would then galvanize where that money can be spent and remember, okay. we're drawing down that money should that come forward on the travel plan. I think that's going to have to be a little bit up to the inspector, but we'll put forward um, what Mr Bailey just said, because we can't, you know, once we get to half the members of the council, it gets a, it gets a bit... <laughs> Okay, right. One further point. I'm just going to pick up what Councillor Borton raised in terms of the TRO issues. Now, obviously, you will be aware that the recommendation from Highways set out on page 85, uh, condition 27, does relate to parking restrictions in Groveswood Drive South. Now, obviously, that would be secured, um, please, um, Casey, see if you correct me if I'm wrong, would be secured by virtue of the 278 agreement. Yes. Um, and, and so I think in terms of just to, to square these matters off, um, you know, you can see the recommendation, parking restrictions, Grove would drive south. Um, personally, I think they are very warranted and very valuable on those issues, and that would be dealt with by so Kent Highways. So to take, I just don't want... Members say, if, how far are we extending them up, and can Kent Highways just comment on that point um, before we take that further? I just want to clarify that. Just what, yes, Mr. Bright, does it cover um, all of the relevant roads that you feel it should do? I think, I think we felt it did, it did do that because it was, it was focused on preventing long-term parking. Clearly, there's, there's, there could well be a role for the travel plan to play here, in fact, in terms of monitoring conditions over time um, I think I think until until we know the geographical scope of what might need to be dealt with it, it's difficult to justifiably extend it any further to be honest what you just said might require a slight variation to what's proposed in the 278 to allow for development over time I'm not quite sure that looking at it that wording allows that at the moment absolutely I mean it we have to draw a line somewhere. Um, I, I think, I think we, we felt that the road that had been earmarked was, was appropriate. So you don't propose amending that at this point? I, I have no grounds on which to do so. Okay. No, I was referring to the monitoring going forward you were talking to about. Well, I, I think... Mr. Ball, this is a bit of a big issue for me, if I'm totally honest here. I think we, I think we need more than this. Um, even if we amend condition 27 to parking restrictions in 
Grove Green or so, oh, not not whole Grove Green, obviously, but but just um, it can't just say Grove Drive South because I know how these things happen is that someone will go that's Grove Drive South and Grove Drive South only. Exactly. Mm. Um, I really do, we need to in some way give officers the greatest flexibility possible. Yeah, precisely. So I'm not. I can't say we can't keep to condition 27, the, the second bullet points as it is at the moment. We really can't. That's not. I can't pallet that. No. That's why I was saying, do we need to amend the 278 to allow for monitoring uh, uh, and possibly an extension of the TRO should such be needed? I, I would think that would be wise. Right. As with the public transport issue where we're talking about monitoring and action being taken, it does seem to me that perhaps with the 278 agreement in relation to the traffic regulation that perhaps we should be saying that some monitoring is required at which might lead to further action further than Grovewood Road itself. We've been caught out with applications elsewhere where we've turned out we thought we'd done enough and then we hadn't, if you see what I'm saying. Yeah, it's, it's clear that members feel strongly about this, this, this issue, so um, I, I see no problem with tweaking the wording to allow for that. I think it's very constructive. Sorry, just so I'm clear, just so I know what I'm putting forward, could I just, what wording, or what, how are we going to tweak that that would have the support for highways at the public inquiry? Sorry. Just so I'm clear, I just want to make sure that we're singing along the same hymn sheet at the public inquiry. If I've understood it correctly, it's, it's a less specific reference. So rather than singling out an individual road, it, we're talking about Grove Green in the general sense. Well, what we're saying is parking restrictions in Grove Green, taking out Drive South, and just parking restrictions in Grovewood Green. In Grove. Okay, in Grove. In Grove Green. Is that your uh, Is that okay? comment, Mr. Bolton? I agree with that, but of course there was two other points made, raised by the Ward Councillor and the Parish Council with regards to it firstly being only one hour a day and secondly being before the development commences, which are important points to be able to capture in this as well, are the officers' conf confidence um, that we can, we can address them too? Um, it is important that the, that the regulation be in place at least bef before the full occupation. Or, um, the, the point is that was made, Mr. Bailey, was by Council Bolton, was getting the TRO in place before the occupation of, of the school. Uh, um, I, I don't disagree, but I think the condition captures that because it says the use or occupation of the development hereby permitted shall not commence until the following highway works yeah. have been fully implemented, and it sets them out. So I think that condition captures you. It's quite a high. In planning to, it's quite a high bar because you're having to get everything in place and TROs, you know. You, okay. So okay. I, th I think it's captured. And then there's the other points about, I think it, uh, the parish council mentioned it would only be one hour a day, perhaps extending that in order to sort of. Or, uh, experience shows that experience shows that the one hour commuter parking bans for want of a better term, do pretty much work in terms, because it stops people parking their cars all, all day and buggering off, as a, to use the technical term, as a commuter. Um, so so it, it is a very effective way without actually inconveniencing more local residents who might want to park there at other times. Is that correct? Yeah. To your point, Councillor Bolton, because I'd now like to move to Councillor Burton. Thank you, Councillor Bolton. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, actually up until about 10 seconds ago, I'd reached the conclusion that on a night when we all seem to be singing from the same hymn sheet, much of what I was going to say has been said. Um, but I would like to, to back Councillor Bolton up on what he's trying to, to get at, I think, with the, um, the need for a little bit more flexibility in, that, in terms of that community band because, because we're not talking about a, a nine to five place of work. You know, we have things like parents' evenings and school plays and, you know, there, there, is, a, there is an element of flexibility that if we can reach a, 
uh, if we can try and build that in, that would be useful, I think, here. So, yeah, so two, so two periods, yeah. So rather than a single period of, of one hour, whether we could build in two periods to be able to have that. I, I think that detail would come forward, as I said, that comes under 28278 under the Highways Act. So in terms of how that interpretation comes forward, if we get too specific now, the inspector's just going to turn around and say, separate legislation, Highways Act. I think you've covered it under those areas, and, and KCC are aware of those issues coming forward, um, and, that, and that will be looked at when the 278 is agreed under that Highways Act legislation. So I, I think we're covered. I think it's noted the concerns members are raising, but I think we're covered it for, for the appeal purposes. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Councillor Powell. Yeah, Mr Chairman, I've listened a lot to what's gone on tonight. And just coming back, I think that Councillor Harwood, it seems ages ago now that you spoke, but you raised some extremely good kind of points, which I don't think have been a, addressed by, by this committee. Um, I'm... <laughs> I'm still very, very confused by the, 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 the KCC highway, or Mr Wright's approach to this. We're not just talking about one school. We're talking about the development on the Kim site. We're talking about one way in, one way out. We're talking about additional traffic um, caused by the, 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 the firm in kind of site that we had a few weeks ago. And it is important that we use this because this is a a cumulative kind of issue. Yes, we're here tonight to look at something that is, well, I think it's disgusting the way that this has gone for non-determination. And I would like to think, if you can hear me, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mr. Bailey, yeah, that, yeah, that, 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 I, I, that, that a letter should certainly kind of go to the inspector to talk about the way in which this was done. Because the reason why we didn't determine it was for a very good reason, and those reasons haven't been asked, answered within this committee. And what you said earlier on, Mr Chairman, I think we can all agree on this committee, because we are trying to get this through. We do want the school, but there are still a number of issues that we need to talk about. And it's no good us t t sitting around this committee tonight. So, yeah, I agree with it. Yeah, we need more school places. Of course we need more school places. This is not just for Maidstone, this is for other areas as well. There's people going to be coming from all over the place to, to use this school. But we can't just say yes, 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 because we need more school places. We've got to look at the much bigger picture. And I'm afraid what we're being asked to do tonight is to make a, a decision based outside of the interest of probably every single person on this council, just because it's been classed as non-determination. I think it's absolutely kind of awful. And um, I really hope the inspector is going to be listening to what we're talking about around this table tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Powell. I don't disagree with you. Uh, we are not where we should be. Councillor Mumford. Well, myself and Councillor Powell have been sat here waiting to join the debate. I would ask the chairman to look back at the webcam and... I'm not sure whether we made a decision, because earlier on I thought we'd made a decision without including all the members to speak. Um, Sorry, Councillor Mumford. Beg your pardon? What? Well, you have been going to and fro up there with the officer talking about when we fight we're going to need this, then going back to the proposer and the seconder constantly, and no one has taken part in the debate apart from Councillor Hartwood right at the beginning, which must have been about half an hour ago. And like Councillor Powell says, it's not accepting something at any cost. And what you've got to do is look at the problem, not the, uh, the symptoms, and look at what's not been said. The symptoms are road safety. That's a symptom Traffic flow through, through road, that's a symptom of the problem. Impact on trees, that's a symptom of the problem. The problem is access. That is the problem. The rest are symptoms. Listen to what's not being said as well. Mr. Wright said that they're comfortable with the option of they looked at a number of access. 
And the question I'd like to ask Mr. Wright, was there a better access that we could now be looking at that was rejected by the developer, probably on cost measures or whatever? Because Mr. Wright did say there was a number of access looked at. So I'm asking Mr. Wright, of the ones that were rejected by the developer, in your mind, was there one that could, would cause us less problems? Mr. Wright, that's a very clear question. Well, of course, I'm only able to look at this from the perspective of the Highway Authority, so there are other I'm mindful that there are other considerations, but as far as the Highway Authority is concerned, the proposal that we, we now have before us is the most suitable option of those looked at in terms of its impact on traffic flow and highway safety. But to, but to uh, further, further help you with your question, Councillor Mumford, the, I think I'm correct, correct me if I got this wrong, Mr. Wright or, or, or Mr. Bailey, but I believe that one of the options was essentially rejected because of its effect on the playing field layout. Now, so if we had taken the view of another planning authority I mentioned earlier and said, no, that wasn't the overwhelming consideration, there would have been um, an access that was probably acceptable, maybe not as good but except in highway terms, but acceptable but it uh, fell foul of other reasons, and there may have been others. Mr. Bailey? Yeah, um, they are set out. I'm not going to repeat them again. They're set out on page 97 and 98. The chairman was just referring to option three on your screen, and it's 6.29 of the report clearly sets out the reasons why that was rejected for a number of reasons. Likewise, option two, there were two options considered that, one a roundabout, and the other one was a signalised junction. It is clearly set out in the report why those various options were discounted, and the highways officer has just informed you that obviously the roundabout option is the one that creates, relieves congestion and creates the best highway safety situation. So I think I'll probably leave it at that particular point, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mumford, do, do you wish to uh, carry on? Thank you. Um, I do apologise if you felt that we were neglecting you, but I did, I did feel that it was important to actually tease out quite what the movers of the motion w were actually looking at, at this, that, that particular point in the debate. Councillor Cox. Thank you very much. It's one for us side, all right? Um, I'd like to ask a couple of questions before I, uh, I really come down on this, where I'm going to vote. Um, it's a couple of, one's a question and one is directed to Mr. Wright again. He mentioned that there are no safety issues due to the modelling that was done around option two with the roundabouts. So the safety issue, is, I think it should be quite a simple, simple question and answer. Did the modelling include human intervention? Were humans placed in the modelling or was it just traffic that was looked at at the modelling? I will come back. You mean cyclists, pedestrians? Or I mean primarily uh, ages between 11 and 18 possibly and going, I'm going there. That's what I would like to know, please. I think perhaps I need to make a distinction here. The, the safety audit would consider the implications of the proposals on all road users. So that would include impacts on pedestrians and cyclists. The modelling is is a capacity exercise to see how effectively the junction will operate based on the volume of traffic that's expected to use it. Yeah, I think that's quite a clear answer. So that's a no, because the modelling was one thing and then the safety issue was another. Yeah, okay, that's right, leave it at that. Um, I'd like, this is another point. Um, there are 30 cycle bays to leave bikes. That's a very, very low percentage. It's 3%, 2%. And, and I'm sure this modelling may have been done, or the, 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 the paperwork, the, the, the application, and the uh, actual architect may have looked at this uh, a long time ago. And I'm afraid trends are changing. Uh, my uh, insider information as to whether or not it's hip to ride a bike 
Um, it's going up because I see at the moment there are excessive 30 to 40 bikes being used at Valley Park. That's currently. So I think that needs to be looked at and maybe expanded. That might encourage people to use bikes if they can lock them up safely. Also, my last point, and I hope this will be able to be taken into consideration, if you go back to the photograph looking from the Ashford Road up towards uh, the proposed roundabout, uh, you will see on that picture that there is, that's the only place, I believe, that there is any ragstone left from the ragstone wall that used to go all the way around the site, certainly down the New Cut Road. Mr. Bailey, could you oblige? And I'd like to know whether we can make sure that, can you go to show us the photograph on New Cut Road from Ashford Road looking up towards the roundabout? Because amazingly, and we pointed this out the first time we spoke to this, uh, the, ro the ragstone wall seems to have disappeared. Um, I haven't been offered any, uh, whilst any building work's been going on, but I wonder where it is. You'll see there on the left, oh, there's just a smattering left. Could we make sure that we can protect this from this meeting forward? If they're going to take it out and it's going to disappear because they've got a fence, can we make sure it's actually protected? I thought our ragstone walls in Maidstone were protected, but that may be another thing. And lastly, the dedicated bus service, I would have to agree with Councillor Willis, the size of that car park doesn't look to me like it would take a double-decker bus going round it, but that's the place to put the bus service. If it's for children, let's have it on site so it doesn't stop the flow of traffic past the wonderful roundabout and then up to the next wonderful roundabout and then the following level of roundabout. So please, all these things could be taken into consideration. Thank you very much. I thought you were going to say it was a magic roundabout. Councillor Round, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, actually, Councillor Cox just got to a point before I wanted to raise it, so I'm not going to go into any great detail about what I feel is a, a totally inadequate cycle policy. Um, but um, at this juncture, I would, I would just add another point. I, I don't really want to discuss whether we're voting for or against or anything else in that respect. But once we do make our decision, whatever it may be, um, it has been alluded to by several members so far tonight. It started with Councillor Borton. Um, you, Chair, then announced your ghast, your total flabbergast, and followed by Councillor Powell has also mentioned um, his disgust with the whole affair. I would just like to ask um, the Democratic Services Officer that that sentiment is actually found in the minutes, please, with, of course, members' agreement to that, because I think we all are somewhat dismayed about the circumstances in which we find ourselves and the attitude in which it has occurred. And I, as a member, certainly feel that although members are faced with this here and now committees, several committees so far, thus far, um, it's also that officers have obviously been put through an enormous amount of stress and turmoil in this respect. And our officers, quite frankly, we give them enough hard work as it is. Um, when it's made even more difficult by something that in inevitably would probably have been a reasonably well-approved application. I find it a total dismay that, you know, bound uh, hurdles have been put in front of not just us as members, but also officers over a great deal of time. I do think the minute should reflect that in some way. Thank you, Chair. Um, up to a point, yes. Um, I'm now going to bring Mr. Bailey back because that concludes the first round of speakers. Other, oh, 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 sorry. I, I, how did I miss you, Councillor Clark? That might explain it. Councillor Clark concludes the first round of speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I think um, the question here is what would we have voted for had this not been um, called in for non-determination? Exactly. And I think that we, as a committee, decided that we would not have actually passed this application because we felt it wasn't the best solution at that site. By deferring, we, by deferring, we were essentially saying we think that this school 
isn't necessarily a bad idea, and I think actually most of this committee would say that they would really want this school to go ahead, but it wasn't the best solution. It may be the best solution for the school to have a school, but, but we could give them that and soften the impact to residents and, and um, traffic users in Maidstone and even the impact to school users on buses because one thing that, that I'm conscious about, I have a child at school who, um, who takes the bus every day, KCC will subsidise a single one of those buses in the morning. So, so you'll have a bus come along every 20 minutes or so and there'll be one bus which has a subsidy. That bus, um, for my school, like for my daughter, she, she um, goes to Mapleton Noakes. It's the one bus in the morning that will go all the way. All of the other ones, if she misses it, um, she's got to stop in town, swap over and get the next bus. That, that bus is, there's contention for that bus for people that are along the A229 who just want to go to, the, the, to Maidstone to work. Very often that bus will go straight past. So it's a real risk to wait for that bus. If she takes one earlier, she'll get to school on time, but she'll have to, she'll have to, um, she'll have to change at, at the cannon. Now, my worry is that students for this school, if we don't get the, the uh, if we don't get the public transport taken care of, they are going to be in all of the arteries that come into Maidstone, competing with current school kids, trying to get on that single subsidised bus, and I, I, it is an absolute nightmare for, for parents. You probably all of you had parents contact you about the buses for, for into school in the mornings. It's a nightmare, and I really feel that we should have had the opportunity to work on this before we, we made a decision. Um, in terms of in terms of the site, I mean, why on earth, given that we gave a strong steer that we were in favour of this school, why on earth we couldn't have had a discussion about? the layout, the in and out access. I just do not understand. And, and I just feel that as a committee, we should send a message to the, to the um, inspector that we were in favor of a school at this site, but we weren't, we weren't convinced by the proposal as it stood. And that, that's my feeling. I, I, I feel quite strongly about that. I think it's quite clear, um, Councillor Clark, that we all feel that this process has not been hmm, the best planning dialogue we've ever had, shall we say. Um, and a number of points are being taken on board. I'll now bring Mr Bailey back to address some of the more recent points that have been raised. Right. Um, start with the wall that's on the photograph. It's outside the application site, so unfortunately members wouldn't be able to suggest conditions for its retention and rebuilding. You will be aware that officers tried to get that included um, and that was part of the discussions and Mr. Jarman I think last year even mentioned it that he wanted that but it's not within the red line boundary therefore any condition wouldn't meet the tests. So you've asked the question I'm just giving you the answer. Um, with regard to cycle parking spaces um, I would refer you to condition 13 on page 82 where the officers don't agree with the current on-site level provision um, and they're suggesting that in that condition it shall include at least 86 cycle spaces from the start and therefore on that basis yeah uh, we're referring to yeah, we're, we're referring to the access point but it doesn't this wall runs down the whole of new cut down the whole of Newcart Road and it only the red line only covers the point of access for the roundabout and you're I'm just answering your question your reference was yeah uh, let, let me finish and then I'll, I'll let me clarify the, the red line only includes the highway measures within the highway boundary to include the new roundabout what it doesn't do is it as you'll see from the plan it doesn't include this ragstone wall which extends down Newcut Road right down to almost the junction with the A20. So that's not within the control. Obviously anything within that highway boundary red line into a minimal part of the ragstone wall is controlling. Well, I I'm answering members' questions. You'll see where the application is and that's on the papers in front of you. If I could go to condition 13, as I said, the officer recommendation on the, on the report is the fact that we increase cycle 
provision on site up to a minimum of 86. The application does include, once the school is open up to its full term, 1,200 pupils, that they would accommodate 172 eventually. We consider that there should be a greater provision at the start of the, um, uh, when the school opens, and therefore that's why condition 13 is. We also, I'll draw your attention to condition 15, we also consider in order for sustainable transport measures and the transport, the travel plan to be effective and to be monitored, that we should reduce the staff parking provision on site. That's the reasons for condition 15, because they're almost providing one-to-one -one parking. If you want a travel plan to work, if you want to seek to promote a modal shift, you don't do it by providing one-to-one -one parking. The standards are maximum. They justify that they meet the standards, but they are maximum. I accept that's slightly out of the norm for what members normally expect, but that's the reasons why officers have put that recommendation condition, because we think the school should work towards a sustainable travel plan, and that's why we put that in there, to reduce on-site parking and therefore make teachers car share, make them look at modal shift, and likewise increase parking provision. The transport assessment, sorry, the interim Excuse travel me, plan. Um, there's too much talking going on. Can we have some quiet, please? You know, we're looking at 1% and 2% cycle usage between Invicta, 1%, and Pent Valley, 2%. That's what they're seeking to achieve, 2%. Is that good enough? I don't think it is. Hence, that's why the condition 13 is recommended. Hence, that's why we put the travel plan in the section 106 and the monitoring. That's why the officers have recommended that and hopefully members would agree that that's the right way forward. Thank you very much. Now, members have expressed some I've been in a minute, consternation about whose wall this is. Is it the applicant's wall or isn't it the applicant's wall? And what, if any of it, is it within the, the actual sight line? Because I wasn't sure from your explanation at all, to be honest. To answer your question simply, I'd need to go online to check whether it's blue line or red line. It may be owned by the trust. It's not part of this application right. to include the elements of this wall. They're not within the red line boundary of this application. I, I appreciate, in terms of what I've previously referred to, if you're looking at that plan, that relates to the red line, as you have to show on an, app, on an application, up to the highway boundary to include the new roundabout. If you look further down, it then indents and cuts back into the site along Newcut Road. So all this wall is not within the application boundary. Okay, that's... Thank you. I was just yeah, trying... on, on that point, um, if the wall is within highways land, then a Section 278 agreement could deal with anything within highways land. And Mr. Wright might wish to comment on that. Also, if it's within the blue line ownership of the applicant, um, it could be dealt with under a LEMP under the section 106 as it's within the applicant's ownership, if that's the case. Okay, I'm so cool. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was only gesticulating and jumping up and down, Mr. Bailey, because you said within the red line. You didn't say the red line that's on here doesn't actually show where the real red line that I'm talking about is where, and it runs down the road, because the red line is a good probably 20 metres back from the road, but we're still taking all these trees out, so I'm trying to protect and make sure that that, that wall that we were told oh, well, that rule's fine, it's okay. Uh, and it's just been disappearing. Nobody knows where. It will disappear because they put a picket fence, a big metal fence around the whole of, the, of their land, and they put it behind that wall. Now, if that was a move to say, I don't want to have to take care of that wall, then it's no different than having a listed building, I see. We need to take care of that wall. Okay, well, the, the, the legal officer has suggested two points that were, were regardless of whether or not they were actually agreed by, because we're not agreeing them, could have been taken forward to discuss with the applicant. So, so they, those could be taken forward because that, that has been put, for, put forward by the legal officer as a route we could have explored. So it is something we could 
raise potentially at, at an appeal hearing. Now, uh, Mr. Wright. Not as such, thank you, Chairman. I mean, clearly we would need to um, check our records to ascertain whether it's within the highway or not. That's quite clearly the point. Um, but if on the, on the first issue, the second issue is, is, of course, whether it fell within the applicant's ownership, which we think it does. But I'm not saying that we would necessarily have, have, ris have raised that if we'd made a decision. I'm just saying that because we're in, in saying what we would have done, we could legitimately say that was an issue we would have explored um, had we actually been determining the application. I think, if you see what I'm saying, did you want to... I'm just, um, the, uh, a colleague has just brought up the, um, the plans and it shows, it appears to show that within, oh, it's just gone off. It's, <laughs> it appears to show that within Blue Land. And I said appears only because in terms of where I'm looking at an extract plan of okay. 1 to 500. So it's not technically within the red line boundary of the application site but it appears, as I said, only appears to be under the control of the trust. Now, I think um, the ward councillor, um, Mr. Willis over there, referred to the relevant trust office. It's eluded me for now, but it, it seems to me that it may well be within the land controlled by the overall trust. I don't know the arrangements around the trust operation and everything else, but what I am telling you, it's not within the red line of the application site, which it doesn't extend all the way down here. But never, nevertheless, it means we could have explored it and we could potentially have explored it under the second option mentioned by the legal officer and that's something we, we could incorporate. Right, we really do need to move this to a conclusion. Councillor Harwood, briefly, if you'd like to come back and then we must move this forward or sideways. Thank you, Chairman. I mean, I mean this, this is going to be, it's going to be a, a disaster, frankly. I mean, we know that in terms of traffic impact. We know in terms of, of all of the, the other issues that go with it. However, we know where we are because of government ideology and so on that we have little choice. But there are some really important, we as a planning committee and we as a planning authority are the custodians of the local landscape and we have certain um, roles that we must perform. I, I am very, very concerned, and this is a really a critical issue for the officers, sorry, is that because we have had the appeal for, um, the, for, for um, non-determination, I am very concerned that all we are, we, you know, we're contemplating our navels with all these conditions, because actually this is why they've gone for non-deferral, not non-determination, because they don't want the, any conditions. What they want is the application that's on the papers. Currently, the, the, the application as is submitted falls far short in many respects, especially, it's got to be said, I mean, not just in some of the, the, um, the transportation issues, but especially in terms of the landscape issues. This is the 1343 boundary to Roger de Vinters Park. And we can see it on the maps going right back. It, it is, I, I suggest, it, it, it is, I come back to section 12 of the MPPF. It, it is a heritage as asset in that right. And there are certain things we need to achieve. For example, they talk about the landscaping. You're, you're taking out trees that are many, many hundreds of years old and have a very significant landscape impact. And, what, and when they're saying that it's gonna be three for one, it's not comparing like with like. Where you're losing towering huge oak trees that, that were old in 1792 and very large in 1792, these are many hundreds of years old. We're getting a lot of non-native species in a planted bed around a car park. And yes, there might be three times more, but none of those trees are going to make it to the age that any of these trees are and there's not the room because that's the other thing if you're actually looking for uh, the, the 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 space of the the woodland that's being lost and then you look at the landscape area once you take into account the operation of the car park and everything else it's, it's a fraction of that area and we come back to this point that was made around the the ebbs fleet case around the playing fields when a number of these people at this committee went to school there 
these playing fields were just the playing fields for Vinter's boys. Because before Invicta um, Girls Grammar, when it was, uh, before they built on their playing fields, it used to front on Huntsman's Lane, that's where theirs were. So now you've got two much larger schools using these playing fields, and now you're talking about another very large school on those playing fields. So we're seeing this incremental reduction in, in the play space and an intensification which is having a, an, an impact on the landscape. And, and, we're, and it, you know, that is not our fault. That is expansion of the schools. And yet we are being told we cannot put landscaping in to mitigate for that lost because it will impact upon the sports pitches. And this is where the Ebbsfleet argument comes in. Well, I'm sorry, this is a, a seven, eight hundred year old park which has got a, a well-defined boundary and we need to replicate that in some way and we need to, to mend that damage. And we need the space to be able to do that. And we don't do it by putting in non-native evergreen oaks and the other things they want to do. We, we've got to restore that setting. But I, I really have a difficulty in how we're going to do that because of the, the position we're in. And that's why I come to the officers. Is there any way we can use the, the powers in the hands of a, of a planning authority to enable and ensure and persuade the inspector that they must take very seriously? I mean, I know we've got the 2012 landscape character assessment and it says that boundary shouldn't be breached and it says this is the quieter end of, of Vinters Park and so on. But it, I, I want to know how we can ensure that we get decent landscaping and we don't get what is currently in the applications pack that you look on the site because it is just absolutely unacceptable for a development of this scale. Right. Thank you, Councillor Harwood. I, 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 that's um, a very specific set of questions in the end. Mr Bailey. I think I'm going to be quite brief. Um, I think in terms of the issue that we would be defending, we would be defending the conditions that members, if members vote tonight to say they would have approved, we would be defending those conditions quite robustly against a national guidance policy statement which says, um, you, you know, in terms of where you impose conditions, they, that, that they will consider that to be technically unreasonable conduct unless supported by clear and cogent evidence. Cogent. So, cogent, sorry. So, we're going to have to, you're going to have to delegate to us that we're going to have to put forward very strong arguments why those conditions are coming forward against the policy guidance which says almost you shouldn't put any conditions. So, I think we're going to have to be very robust in defending those conditions. We're going to have to refer to our landscape character guidelines. We're going to have to refer to all these matters to demonstrate why we're coming up with that list of conditions, which in the back, up to 27 conditions, is a lot of conditions in terms of what the policy statements we should be doing anyway. So we're going to have to do that at the public inquiry, and I would hope that there are going to be local members, because part of the Constitution on that issue looks at support from local members to demonstrate that issue and why there is such a strong feeling to make sure we get those conditions pushed forward, and likewise, why we're going for this Section 106 obligation, which they will be arguing we shouldn't have any of it, shouldn't have any obligation on it. It's going to slow delivery. That's what they will say. We need to come up with all these arguments why we're putting those forward. So I think, to answer Councillor Harwood, so I know that there's a difficult decision for members. It is a difficult decision going forward. Um, but we're going to have to be robust to argue these conditions in the first place. Right. Thank you, Mr. Bate. I think it's fair to say, Councillor Harwood, that we could argue that notwithstanding the importance of getting the school delivered and the other things that non-native municipal car parking uh, can, is not a type landscaping is not an adequate response. So I think it would be fair that we would, I think we would be able to make a fair argument. And the, the conditions set out and the ones that we've discussed tonight that we would have also mentioned seem to me to represent a a, a reasonably cogent and, and uh, coherent argument. But if there's anything particular, additional, that you would like to add to the decision, I, I'd like to hear it now. But 
I, I, I wonder then whether we should put the, ju the justification into the landscaping condition. The fact that this is the 1343 Roger de Winter boundary, the fact that we have a Repton Red Book showing this tree boundary and its tree line and the importance of this vista. Uh, you know, they, they're very, they, there are very few reps and red books for, the, for anywhere in Brit British Isles. I mean, I, I think actually that the, the red book is in the Smithsonian Institute, but it is online. You can see each page, and I know that Mr. Bailey has. But, I, I, but it's, it's got a very, very special history, and, and, and that's where I keep referring back to the MPPF and, and Section 12, in that I do think we need an additional justification. This is not any old line of trees. It's, it's a very significant line of trees in its historic context, you know, not just with James Watman in the, in, in the, the 1780s, 90s, but, but going back to, to the, uh, the Bishop of, uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Howard. I'm glad you were brief. Um, the, right, I don't see as any reason why we can't add the, his, the context. It would seem to strengthen the argument. Um, but unless anyone wants to add anything else specific, I think we've probably reached the point where we really do need to move towards a vote on. Um, we've got the conditions, we've got the points that have been added and clarified, we've, we've got the additional justification. Is there anything else anyone wishes to add at this point? Now, in that case, I shall be moving towards a vote on the recommendation, which I was going to refresh people's memories on. Yes, I, I need clarification as to exactly is on the monitoring committee because it did become quite confusing as to which members would be involved. Mr. Bailey recommended that it would be in the representatives for key stakeholders, Kent Highways, and the political group spokespersons. And did you mention anyone else? No, you didn't. I mentioned potentially bus the bus operators, bus, bus but operator. KCC do represent and speak for them on their behalf. So. Um, um, the feeling being that um, we did need to keep the numbers down to something manageable. Does that clarify it, Mrs. Smith? Thank you very much. Any other clarifications? Mr. Bolton was first. What about Boxley Parish Council? It is actually in Boxley, isn't it? Um, uh, if we can, we, we will include Boxley Parish Council if we can. I, I mean, as mentioned, I, I, I am the Boxley Parish Councillor for Woodlands Ward because it's a warded parish. Yes, um, but as sort of a dual mandate there, but yes, it, he does actually sort of cover half of the relevant area. So, Councillor Bolton, did you? Was, yeah. Um, Right. Okay. Is everyone clear what we're voting on? Right. Mr. Bailey, would you want to sum up your understanding? Or I'll add to it if you want. <laughs> well, I'll do it if you prefer. I, I get the difficult job at the end. Um, okay. My, my understanding, and, and obviously, you know, committee services will correct me, um, in terms of it is relatively simple, I think. Um, in terms of members have resolved, well, we'll get to the debate, members as it's proposed. Yeah, it's proposed at this time um, that we go forward with as per the recommendation on the papers. Um, we seek to negotiate delegated powers to the Head of Planning to negotiate on the terms of the Section 106 for the public inquiry. Um, in effect, as it currently stands, that we defend uh, rigorously the decisions and the Section 106 requirements and KCC are here to help us defend on those particular matters. Uh, we amend Condition 27 in terms of parking restrictions and we take out Grovewood Drive South and we go parking restrictions in Grove Green. Um, so we get a change on that. In terms of the justification, in terms of, and I think it's a good thing that Councillor Hull would raise in terms of the statement of common ground, there's no reasons why, matter of fact, we can't refer to the landscape issues in the statement of common ground in the Red Book because they can't disagree with it. And that's the reason part of the negotiation that we deal with on a public inquiry. We deal with statements of common ground and they deal with facts. So let's put them in there. And I'm quite happy to make the officer um, put those recommendations forward. So my understanding is the changes that were proposed are relatively minor from those set out on the report, except the issues which I forgot is about the setting up of this monitoring committee and asking 
the setting up of the monitoring committee comprising those members that we've just discussed to should the terms of the travel plan not be met that we're going to secure then obviously then those members would be used to draw down that money to make in terms of sustainable transport measures. So that's my understanding. Correct me if I'm wrong. I believe you got it right. Um, yeah. That's what we'll be suggesting. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Um, right. Everyone clear? Great. Well, those in favour of the recommendation as proposed and seconded? <coughs> Those against? That's eight and four. There must be abstentions. One, so that adds up. Can I have my formal dissent noted, please? Of course, Thank Councillor you. Harwood. Right, we now move rapidly on uh, to the item on five, Tunbridge Road. I'm not sure. I must thank the Environmental Health Officer for being here this evening. I, I'm not entirely sure <laughs> where he needs to be, but we shall find out. Um, this, this application is, is on the papers, but we don't have any speakers. But I imagine that ward members will be wanting to speak to this, so we will have the report introduced. Um, but you're going to have to give me a moment. A couple of minutes before we do, for obvious reasons of natural convenience. But as, a, as board, at least one board member wishes to discuss it, um, quite rightly, we will need to introduce the report. Right, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, it's the removal of Condition 14, which relates to air quality um, mitigation for the uh, approved scheme at 5 Tunbridge Road, which allowed uh, or gave planning permission for 65 dwellings. Uh, essentially, Condition 14 reads... Uh, a scheme of mitigation to address poor air quality affecting the residential amenity of occupiers shall be provided and uh, scheme of mitigation fully in place uh, prior to first occupation. Uh, this condition was imposed initially uh, because the air quality assessment at that time uh, was, was inadequate and didn't um, sort of um, clarify the air quality issue. Since then, the site next door at 3 Tunbridge Road, which is next door, um, has had um, a greater detail of air quality assessment done, um, which actually found out that uh, the levels of air quality um, were acceptable. And on that planning permission, um, uh, an air quality condition wasn't placed um, because there wasn't uh, an identified issue. So obviously this application seeks to remove that condition from the earlier consent. So obviously we've uh, kindly, Stuart, uh, the Environmental Health Officer has come here this evening. So uh, I'll open up to uh, the Chair and any subsequent questions. Um, may I say first of all, thank you Mr Maxwell, for, oh, sorry, Dr Maxwell, for coming on this evening and for listening so patiently to, to this uh, meeting. It probably was a better choice than the football, but, but, but um, um, may I ask whether you have any um, observations on, on the condition at this point. Um, only to say that, um, I'm sorry I haven't got very much of a voice as well, um, just to say that we've been monitoring it outside the site. We've got 10 months worth of data, so we've nearly got a full year's worth, and it's quite clear that the air quality levels on the site won't exceed the air quality objective, which is what that condition is intended to protect residents against. I knew that's very clear. 
Right. Um, <coughs> we have an urgent update on the papers, um, which I direct members' attention to. Um, very brief. Um, the, um, can I take any declarations of lobbying? You've been lobbied as the ward member, unsurprisingly. Is anyone else? No, just Councillor Borton. Um, right, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr Chair. And this area of the Tunbridge Road we've discussed many times at this committee. Um, and um, so as a ward member, I've got no problem with the principle of development here at all. That's all been established. But um, the difference between number three Tunbridge Road and number five Tunbridge Road, and this is number five Tunbridge Road, is um, in essence the scheme for number three Tunbridge Road is for 20 dwellings. This is for 65 dwellings. This is a considerably larger scheme um, as well. And, um, and the issue ha I have is, uh, is therefore this should um, seek to contribute towards the, um, the air quality objectives um, of the council. I hear what's just been said by the environmental officer about the data for the last 10 months, but my concern is, and um, certainly the concern of sort of folk I speak to in the area, is that is that a, um, a large, long enough period of time in order to come to such a different conclusion um, on, this, uh, on this particular issue? The argument from those of us in the area is that, no, that's not necessarily a long enough period of time. It's, um, it's, only, um, it's only 10 months, it's not a year. Which, ten, which two months of the year are we missing out? Because I'm not quite sure, for example. And I don't feel that we've got enough of an evidence base yet in order to justify the removal of this particular con condition on 5 Tunbridge Road, specifically when this is an application for a much larger number of dwellings than the application site next door. So that's the basis of my concern. And obviously, when we've discussed these application sites, that committee, um, we have spoken about air quality. In fact, we deferred it on air quality grounds um, not very long ago, a few months ago. Uh, the next, the, the neighbouring sites, sorry. Um, so um, this is a real problem, and a little bit like Lower Stone Street, you've got the sort of the funnel effect coming as you come down or up the Tunbridge Road um, here. And I really, I don't think this sends a good message out from the council either as to its stance towards air quality matters, which we're concerned at. But sticking to the actual uh, sort of the application in front of us and the um, proposal to remove the condition, I'm not. But I'm not convinced that 10 months is, a, is, a, is enough of a period in, in time in order to justify removing this condition, considering the, large, the num, number of dwellings compared to the site next door. So that's the basis of my sort of my calling and my objection and what local people are saying, Mr. Chair. And obviously, I'd be interested in what other members see and hear as well. I'll take Councillor Harwood before I bring the officers back. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, we're very aware that a lot of other local authorities, they perhaps have a lower burden of evidence required in terms of air pollution. And I know that the government is actually bringing forward new guidance on the fitting of air filters and so on, because they feel that local authorities are perhaps putting a, placing a burden, so to speak, upon developers. However, um, there is no safe level for particulate pollutants. Um, this is a fairly steep incline, this stretch of Tunbridge Road. Where I walk up and down it every day, and you're getting a, a lung full of you know, diesel exhaust all the time. And, and I live on Tunbridge Road, and the black soot that is on the inside of the windows the entire, is very significant, and the traffic does not stop day and night. There is, as, um, as Councillor Borton pointed out, a canyon effect here. And you have the added issue here that we still have diesel in, um, diesel locomotives actually moving along in the, on the barracks line. And they, there's quite a pool of soot that they give off as well. So with the kind of double whammy between uh, 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 the, the, the um, rising highway, the traffic volumes we have on there, and the railway, I just wonder whether particulates, and especially microparticulates, have been measured, or are we just looking at uh, nitrogen dioxide as a kind of cipher for all other pollutants? I'd, I'd just like to know what we're monitoring, really. There's a couple of uh, interesting questions there, Doctor, so if you'd like to uh, come back on. 
And, <coughs> excuse me. The monitoring that we've done is nitrogen dioxide. Um, the reason is that it's nitrogen dioxide that we, we know we've got an exceedance of in the district. We ha haven't got an exceedance of PM10, which is um, which the council does have an obligation uh, to monitor. We, as far as I know, we don't have an exceedance of PM2.5. You are right to say there's no safe level, but that would apply equally anywhere. So uh, I, I think you, you would be looking at putting in this sort of mitigation on any site um, if, if, you were, if it was against PM2.5. The point with this mitigation is you're, you're, you're basically, you're sealing people in, 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 in a sealed box. It's a, I think it's a bit of an unsatisfactory solution in, in many ways. But what you don't want to do is to expose people to a, um, a level of pollution greater than the, the objective, the air quality objective. Uh, specifically in this case it is for NO2 that I'm talking about. Where we would have a problem um, is I th a, a bit of a dilemma is if we were talking about the, the objective level is 40. If we were measuring levels of 39, 40, even 41 and 42, small exceedances. Then we have to say, is it, do we really want to lock people in these sealed boxes forevermore when I think all the evidence is that air quality is improving and will be improving now. We will have, we'll have a greater proportion of electric vehicles, of Euro 6 vehicles. We will see improvements in air quality coming through. So there is a bit of a dilemma if, if you're measuring borderline levels. You're not measuring borderline levels on this site. We're, we're measuring levels of um, 33 at, at the roadside at the front of the site. And just to pick up an, a couple of other points that you made, because this condition is aimed at residents on the site, in a way, the size of the site is irrelevant because you don't want to put one, even one person uh, in an area of exceedance. It's not about the, the, the condition doesn't relate to the impact of the site on the surrounding area. It's simply about the residents on that site. And as I said, the, uh, what we're measuring is, is not borderline. It's very clearly considerably below the objective. Thank you, that's very clear. Uh, Mr. Powell, Councillor Powell. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think the report that we've got here tonight is, I mean, it's far too woolly for us to actually kind of make a, a decision, and I totally agree with what Councillor Bolton and Councillor Harwood said earlier on. And the comments that we've just had, I think I picked up on one word, was, which was, uh, was it locked in sealed boxes? Well, that's exactly the reason why we're talking about air quality, because the amount of people actually kind of die from the, um, the, the, the resulting effects. Um, what I would like to see is more information coming into the reports, and certainly within this case, because we're told, yes, that, that it just falls way below whatever the re required measurement should be and everything is okay but I'd actually like to see maybe on a month-by-month -month basis and just to pick up on what Councillor Bolton said as well, to actually do a year-on-year -year comparison. Because remember, we're not actually kind of talking, we, well, we are talking about what it is at the moment, but we're also trying to work out what the projected difference is once the properties are built. So it's very, very difficult to base a decision or even come to an agreement on something when we haven't really got the full information in front of us. Um, maybe I'm missing something. Um, uh, you're sort of implying there, Councillor Powell, that the properties themselves would add, would add to the air pollution. I'm not quite sure. No, not the actual properties, but the, res the resulting traffic movements from those properties. Okay, that's, that's a little clearer. Thank you. Um, but could, could I actually try and explore what further information you or possibly other members are actually seeking? 
Yeah, the, the information is the actual kind of the, the air quality kind of report, if we can actually have some actual kind of numbers on the report as to what it is like. I mean, we all know that air quality is different at different times of year, but also to do a, maybe a, as, as Councillor Bolton said, 10 months wasn't really enough. I'd like to see maybe two years and actually be able to do a, a comparison and then we can actually kind of work out whether there's a projection moving forward. Um, okay, look, uh, as far as I can see, a nu a nu numbers were provided, but the, the key question I think was the one that Councillor Bolton asked in the first place was uh, uh, um, whether 10 months was considered to be an appropriate measurement period, I, which is the one question, Doctor, I don't think you did ask. <coughs> Sorry, it was in my head and then it went out of my head. Um, w when you measure NO2, NO2 does change throughout the year. It's always higher in winter months and lower in summer months. Um, so you would ideally like at least six months of monitoring and uh, they would uh, ideally be three winter months and three summer months. However, there is a, a way of correcting, if you have less than a year's worth of data, there is a correction factor that you can calculate. Um, with the 10 months of data that we've got, for, we, we started uh, in October, um, we've gone through to August, um, but for some reason, which I don't understand, the lab haven't sent our results for July yet. So we're, we're missing July and September. I, I did my best um, effort at calculating the correction factor turned out to be 0.95. So it's, it's a very, it's, a, it's um, almost one. So you, because you've got almost a year's worth of data, it's a very minor adjustment. Uh, and I come back to the fact that uh, so something else I did mean to mention, this condition is only about the residents on the site, that the, the impact of those 65 dwellings, and I'm not sure what the impact really is because the traffic assessment shows a, a, much, a, a much less traffic associated with the new development than with the existing use of the site. But there, but there are three other conditions dealing with air quality uh, in terms of the impact of that development. This condition is only relevant to people living on that site, not to anybody else, and it's to make sure that no one is exposed to a level of NO2 greater than 40 micrograms per cubic meter. Um, and our measuring it, uh, our monitoring is very clear that no one will be. Hey, thank you. I, I see some puzzlement around the room. I think what Mr. Dr. Maxwell is saying is that because you have to take into account in vehicle movements the previous commercial use of the site, which, which would have been quite significant. Um, as indeed it would be with the neighbouring site. Did you want to add anything, Mr. Bain? Very simply, what we're looking at here is, is the condition still relevant? And we get back to these tests again. I read it, six tests that we go back to, and it's, is it still relevant? And Dr. Maxwell here, I think, has explained that actually it isn't still relevant because those occupiers, in terms of mechanical ventilation, aren't going to exceed that level of 40 micrograms. I'm, correct me if I'm wrong. So on that basis, you've got your expert opinion, which saying it's not going to exceed it, therefore it's not reasonable to impose that condition. So a Section 73A application, is, which this is, has to look at, it doesn't look behind the permission, it can only look at, is that condition still reasonable? And effectively, your officer has then instructed you to say, it is now not needed. And I think that is... Now, as I put it simply, not in Dr. Maxwell's terms, that is what members are being asked to look at now. I think that's quite clear. Councillor Burton, and then we shall move to a conclusion. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I, I was actually just going to move the um, recommendation as per the papers. I think what we've got here is... It? Oh, yeah, and the urgent update, sorry. Um, I, I, think, I think what we've got here is, a, is an issue of sort of per, perce perception of the problem versus the evidence to hand, and it's the evidence to hand that we have to make the decision on, so. 
I'd just say, uh, Councillor Burton, uh, I'm, I'm going to second what you say. I was surprised, but the evidence is the evidence, and frankly, I, I don't think we can, can really argue with that, regrettably. I must admit, I was slightly surprised, but, but it, you know, we are where we are with things like this, so I will second the, the recommendation to approve with the urgent update. Anyone else wishing to speak to this? No. In that case, I'll put the recommendation for, for as much. One moment. Could, uh, just to be completely clear, could we please just add into the urgent update um, delegated powers to the head of planning and development for the terms of the legal agreement? Yes, that would be appropriate in, in light with our normal uh, wording. Yes, thank you very much. That's very okay with that, Matt? Okay. Well, those in favour of the recommendation as moved and seconded. Those against? Abstentions? Two. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you, Doctor, for being so patient as to wait to... <laughs> For so long. Um, we now move back to the non-planning uh, application part of the agenda. We have appeal decisions and we have a correction in the urgent update, which is unfortunate. But uh, we, um, and uh, uh, and uh, as I say, the appeal decisions are on page 112 and also in the urgent update. Um, anyone want to make any comments on these members? Mr. Bailey, to draw people's attention to the correction. Uh, yes, no, I've got nothing to add. I think they're a good suite of conditions. We're doing very well in, uh, in terms of uh, appeals. Um, I'll just draw your attention. Unfortunately, we did um, uh, have an appeal allowed um, for uh, a, a site um, which was granted a temporary three-year consent, um, contrary to... Uh, members' recommendation. Uh, it's unfortunate, but as I said, that will have to stand for three years and we'll review that situation in due course. But overall, I think the appeal decisions are generally going, um, you know, we're still sitting about 73% in terms of in favour, which is a high percentage, so I think we're doing well. That is um, particularly pleasing to see the result of Bell Farm in Harwich. And congratulations to all concerned. Right, we now move to the section 106 delivery report, which is on the agenda. Something that members are often interested in. Mr. Bailey, if you'd just like to very briefly say a few words. Uh, yeah, just to introduce the report again, as members will know, this comes quarterly. Uh, just, this is Money's Held. Um, it's done a traffic light system. At the front page, page 115, sets out what monies we are holding. We are holding quite considerable sums of money you know, £2 million pounds of public open space, and it sets out quite clearly what they are. We use a traffic light system at the bottom to give you a legend. Um, that sets out where we're, where we're at risk in terms of green highlighting, obviously with our uh, SIL uh, compliance in terms of spend by dates. So they are monitored uh, moving forward. As you said, you will notice some of the red, lighter, red, red traffic light systems, but they are being looked at, and there is a project status next to it so members can go through that project status um, and effectively I hand that over to members. Uh, it's an update um, in terms of progress moving forward. You'll obviously be aware um, obviously in terms of still issues moving forward that's probably not a, an arena to discuss in this area. This is monies held um, as part of our section 106. Thank you Mr Chairman. Council Thank you, Chairman. Um, there's a couple for the fencing at, at South Park. Um, one is listed in red status and one in yellow status, but that seems to be moving forward now. Is, is that just lagging on the indicators? Half in High Street Ward, half in South What, not, what page? Oh, sorry, if you could just refer to it, then I could maybe...
Yeah, just to... Uh, yeah, I think I would agree on that. It's just on the project status. Um, as I said, it's, it says to commence 2017-18. Um, the spend-by date is, as I said, December, October 2019. So it is within project plan period um, when it will be spent. So it's still on course. But as I said, that's why we monitor it and we flag it. Um, and we raise that with our discussions with our Section 106 officer in parks to make sure that that money is spent so we're not paying it back. And likewise with the um, yellow one, as I said, spend date on page 118. Um, it says in the project status in terms of what monies um, have been spent. And we've obviously got a period of time, 2019. Um, so, you know, there are discussions. It's to do with spend by date payback dates, because obviously if we don't, if the 106 says you must spend it in X years, we traffic light it to make sure we don't pay it back. So there are, the project status is giving an indication to members in terms of the plan of, the, of when that money's going to be spent to give you an idea that we're not going to lose it. Um, but, and that's what the traffic light system does. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to ask Mr. Bailey, I know there have been issues, because there is so much money in the parks budget here, and there, there have been significant staffing issues within the parks team for a very long time. I'm, I'm very aware that even though the traffic lights might still say green, that the number of, these are Section 106s attached to a development, there have been people living in some of these developments now for years and years and years, and we've still not delivered the green infrastructure in this case that we as a committee and, and officers felt is required to, to, to allow that additional development to take place. And I mean, there's two that certainly I've been very involved in, um, the, the site in Buckland Hill for the local wildlife area and fencing and so on there, and also the, some of the work at the, at the River Len, you know, from the Astley House development. These, you know, these are now mature developments, and yet still nothing has taken place. I, I know that there were some discussions as to whether we actually unbolt the delivery of Section 106 infrastructure from the rest of the parks team, you know, what they do, making sure there's no wildlife on our sites and whatever else they do. Um, I, 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 just, I just wondered if we'd got anywhere um, with that. The other issue is, as, as you may be aware, um, that there is very soon going to be a planning application within North Ward um, when the Victoria Public House is demolished for, for an area of public realm in front of the new ticket office that is proposed. And there is a real cash flow issue in terms of delivering the quality that the locals demand. Um, the, the, you know, we, there was just a feeling that if we've got, you know, we, we can't deliver the public realm that the residents want and that the town demands, and yet we've got millions sitting unspent within Section 106. Is there any way we can either release some of the, the money we've got here, or perhaps other Section 106 monies, to, to help um, as, as a catalyst for delivery of, of that site near the East Station? It's a very good point. Well, two very good points. I mean, the fact of the matter is it's been extremely frustrating, this slow pace, snail's pace. No, sorry, that's very insulting to snails, of, of disbursement of some of the Section 106 monies that held. We've got to do better. Um, I think it's a fair point to say, well, it was raised several times by several my members and officers in the planning review that we really need to decouple this, the, not just the parks, section 106, but, but a number of others from the relevant departments and have specific delivery um, it, within the section 106 program. It really does need doing. Um, if, if members are so minded, we can pass those views on again to strategic planning and sustainable transport when they receive the report shortly of the planning review. Um, 
on the second point, uh, I think it needs raising more. It does need raising, um, perhaps to that committee, but certainly there have been discussions, and, and I'm aware that we, we are having discussions in relation to public art and public realm over the issues over the next couple of weeks before reports go to the relevant service committees on the planning uh, issues relating to, particularly to public arts, but to an extent to public realm as well. So if members agree that the, that issue should be taken forward as well, I don't see why we couldn't. But before we vote on anything, Mr. Bailey. Yeah, um, I'm not a great one for going into internal politics, but obviously the issues with the parks team, you know, they have a new um, head of service in terms of they split, the parks team has been split. Uh, Jason now heads up um, the issues in terms of the council's assets, in terms of the leisure centre, and obviously Jennifer Shepherd, who uh, manages the depot, uh, deals with the issue on parks now. So that split has occurred, and I think I've seen an advert for a new parks manager if I'm not forgetting on the council's website. So those issues are happening um, in terms of, I know it's been a concern with members, and likewise it's a big concern with officers. You negotiate on a scheme and there's money that sits in the pot for quite a long period of time and not spent. So I get just as frustrated as you do with it not being spent. Hence why um, we went through a lot of work in terms of trying to get this project status updated so members could see actually how the money's been spent. There is a, a limit and a degree, if I'm honest, in terms of what planning can do, because it is down to that parks team to go on and deliver that money. I'm not trying to name blame here. I'm trying to say we collect it, um, and, and it is concerning. Hence, that's why a lot more work goes into dealing with the Section 106 project officer and the parks team in trying to get that coordination so when we report to members, we're not just reporting, you know, that there's money sitting there not being spent. So I know it's a concern. Members could flag that up um, to those relevant committees. Uh, I think Jennifer Shepherd now heads that up in terms of taking it forward. Um, and yes, I can understand the concerns in terms of delivery. The monies are going to increase. You've, you've delivered a lot more housing schemes. There's going to be a lot more money coming into this pot um, in the near future because the housing schemes will start to come on stream and so will the Section 106 delivery. So I, I can understand your um, I have no criticism. Right. Yes, well, we'll come back to that. Um, right, in terms of the first issue, I, I'm, I'm quite certain of the changes in, in terms of the, the operational management of improved things, Jennifer, and I'm not going to go into individuals, but, but operational management and Section 106 delivery are not, necess are not necessarily the same thing. And so I, I would like to ask this committee to refer to formally um, state to strategic planning and sustainable transport committee our view that, this, that there needs to be more specific um, delivery of the Section 106 program, not just in parks, I'm not singling them out in, uh, because there are other issues as well, um, through, through a changed arrangement. Um, <clears throat> and we don't need to go into to the details of that, but, but we've, along the lines that we have discussed, we've, we've, we've through um, appropriately top slicing to fund uh, Section 106 delivery outside of the departmental structure. And I think all the members of this committee are in, have been in favour of that in the past. So we can, can we agree we're going to take that forward? Right, on the specific point about the East Station, uh, um, it's a public realm issue, and I would say, Councillor Harwood, that, that there's been a meet, there is a meeting coming up um, with some relevant officers that I, uh, that I believe that um, Council around myself, um, the Chairman and Vice Chairman of SPS and TIA are going to be going to. So if you care to put your concerns down on paper, I think we can take those forward to that discussion. Is that what you? I, I, I think the point that I'm making is that well, it's broader than one. That, that there is a real and uh, you know requirement to lever in additional cash to that scheme now. If we're going to get 
what we aspire to because it, we aren't going to get it any other way unless we put some money in. I, and, I, and, it's, and it's quite urgent, and I'm wondering whether there should be a conversation perhaps between Mr Bailey and perhaps Mr Foster in the ED team to see whether there is any solution through Section 106, even if that is just a commitment f for Section 106 for future developments. As, as you mentioned, there's lots in the pipeline where, where the legal detail is not yet agreed. If we can identify a pipeline of money, that helps us in levering in the other cash. I think we can do both then. We do both. Unless you have a reason we shouldn't. I just want to be open and honest with members. I don't want to be a, you know, the Section 106 contributions, as we always said, have to meet those tests. And when we put the Section 106, they're clearly identified those monies for where they're going to be spent. So I'll be very honest. I'm not going to say that, I'll say, certainly say we will discuss and, and I'll liaise with um, John Foster um, in terms of economic development and we'll go through the list of contributions to see if there are any ways that money could be used but in most of the recent agreements I would say to members the answer would be no and I'm not being it's because I'm being inflexible it's because the conception 106 doesn't allow me to do it there are older permissions in here which don't have such tight restrictions on it and I can commit that I can liaise and I'll have a discussion with the section 106 officer and John Foster about possibilities I know the concerns about the shortfall in income and whether that project actually comes forward because of it. Um, I've had the same thought myself um, and I can say at least I can go through it and we can see whether there's any legalistic way that I can look at those matters. Um, and we can address it, um, the general issue from the policy discussion that, that, that's, around, that's being held in advance of the meeting of <coughs> which I was talking about. So we can do both issues. Members agreed? Thank you very much. As constructive suggestions. Thank you. Right. Anything else? No. You'll be glad to know I'm not going to give you a long list of chairman's announcements. All I would say is thank you, members, for your patience over what has been a, a marathon two-week meeting. And thank you, before we depart, for, to Councillor Round for standing in last week and for a, a slightly longer time than we anticipated this evening.